Good morning, Dan. Hey, good morning. I well, love oh, sorry. I'm no, I, that music was, was great. I was really vibing, you know? I know, man. And it allowed everyone to get logged on. Thank you, everyone, for joining us across YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. We are so glad to welcome you to X Day Spring 2022. Oh, I'm excited. I That's know. Let's minute, like, going. Got me excited. <laughs> <laughs> we have lots coming up for you. I'm super excited for today. And not only for Matt Seltzer, this, the keynote speaker that will be coming up, but with the giveaways and everything else that we're doing. So there's a right. lot. We have a lot to show you in the products. I love, you'll hear from other people besides myself, which depending <laughs> on if you like my voice or not, might be nice. I don't know. We'll see. But no, we have a lot of exciting, a lot of exciting things happening today and for Research Monday. So I think right now in the comments, what do, what do we want people to do? So I want people from. to tell us where they're from. Yeah. Um, let us know where you're from. I'm uh, actually, Dan and I, are, well, I'm in Austin, Texas. Dan is in Round Rock, Texas, just a little bit north. I can't claim Austin. I tell people that. So, yeah. um, and we are so excited you're here. Let us know where, where you're from in the comment section. If you are on LinkedIn, leave us some comments and we will make sure to see them. And we've got our whole marketing team in the background, making sure to, you know, that sees everything and engages with you. We'll even be able to, you know, toss a few up on the screen as you let us know. Okay, here we go. We got Jeanette from Canada. Nice. We got Raku who just moved to DC from Nashville. Nice. That's keep, awesome. Keep I, hope you, right there. I know. I know. So keep, you know, make sure to comment and let us know where you're from. We love knowing that we have people all over the globe. And if you have questions for our speakers coming up, also make sure to put those in the comments because we will be monitoring them. And we want to hear from you guys. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Use the comments. We're going to be monitoring those all day. We want to make this as interactive as possible. Of course, we have things planned. We want to show you all of the great things we're doing at Question Pro. But use the comments. We want this to be as interactive as we can. And I know, like Crystal said, the marketing team will be monitoring those. And okay. we'll be seeing them as well. So when we're showing the products, showing things, ask your questions. We'll make sure that they're answered on live today, if not. We'll definitely follow up with you and make sure that your questions get answered. So use the comments, use the comments, use the comments, I think is the key. <laughs> yeah. And use the hashtag. If yeah. you're sharing us, um, just use XDay2022. It's a little basic, but it definitely, shorter the better sometimes on the hashtags. I know sometimes you you're fumbling it around, you know, trying to get them in. So XDay2022 <laughs> is the, the way to go. Um, and then, of course, let me get rid of this banner. If you guys are joining us, make sure to get a Starbucks on us. Uh, just scan that QR code or click the link in the comments and you can get a $5 Starbucks card on us. I know I'm already drinking mine. I just like secretly oh, put it. You went this morning? It, I, yeah. <laughs> I just secretly put it in this cup. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have mine delivered on X day days. And... Only on X day days do I have my Starbucks delivered. Um, so if you guys want a $5 Starbucks gift card, make sure to scan that QR code and, uh, you know, um, comment on social media when you get our, co when you get coffee. Yeah. We like pictures too. So if you, you know, selfie with the coffee, bonus points for that. Yeah. Okay. And then what else we got going on? Oh, throughout the week, Dan, tell us about the other ways you can hang out with Question Pro besides. Yeah. There <laughs> are many ways you can hang out with Question Pro. So I do a live weekly hours. show. What's that? At all hours. At all hours. Anytime you want. These are on demand, <laughs> most of them. So I do a live weekly show Fridays at 11. I think we're up to 60 plus episodes now. So, yeah. Closing on that 100 you know, milestone there. So we do that. And then we also have MRX Influencers, which is a podcast where we take some of the content from Live with Dan, put it into podcast format. So take us on your walks, your runs, your commutes, whatever's convenient for you. We have Work at Life, which is with Sonia from our workforce team. She leads the Work at Life podcast, which is, is a part of the HubSpot network, I believe, right, Crystal? Is that? Mm -hmm. And so she, she does that with Maddie Grant. And we also have CX Thoughts, where... Uh, Ken, our CX leader, writes his CX thoughts each week on Tuesday. Uh, that's why they're doing CX Tuesday tomorrow uh, for their product showcase. 
We have office hours, which Crystal hosts once a month. I believe once a month, right, Crystal? Is that more than yes, that? Yes, I do. Yeah, nice. And then we have Experience Matters, which is our CX live show um, run out of APAC. But there's a lot of great content on there that's not specific towards APAC. It can be more general as well. So I know last week they were talking about a new initiative, uh, Question Pro for Startups. So oh yeah, we have six ways right here that you can interact with Question Pro. So all of these shows are great. I'd recommend tuning in to each one of them for a little bit different content, depending on what you're into and the area of research that you're in. So that's how you can keep up with Question Pro. Perfect. Okay. And then I guess it's a little late, but here we are. If you didn't know, now you know, right? <laughs> now oh. you know. <laughs> uh, and look at our little matching photos here, Dan. I know. I think we're at the same place, maybe, huh? What? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, if you didn't know, I'm Crystal Weiss. I'm the director of marketing here at Question Pro and my amazing colleague, Dan Fleetwood, the president of research and insights. Man, this banner, I, when I made this little treat yourself banner, I did not take into consideration <laughs> this white yeah. presentation. It's all right. That's all right. Get the QR code for coffee. That's all you need. Right. Man. You just yeah. get the QR code. That's all you need. Yeah. Um, okay. So starting at 10 o'clock, well, maybe, you know, we got a little late start today about by that five minute timer. I should have started five okay. minutes earlier. Right. Right. Um, but we've got the wonderful Matthew Seltzer joining us. And I cannot wait to hear from what uh, hear from him. Our pre X day conversation could have made just even an interesting X day conversation. I'll say any conversation I had with Matt is always could be a keynote. He's that good. So I'm really excited that he's going to be joining us today to talk about the Muse researchers role and outputs for inspiration. So it's going to be great. And We'll be giving away his book too, right, Crystal? Yes, we do have a giveaway. We have a giveaway almost every hour during yeah. X Day this year or this day, today, just today. There's also, you know, giveaways tomorrow. So make sure you stick around because anyone who attends Matt's session gets a free copy of Matt's book. And I, you know, I mean, I'm going to get a free copy of it. So, yeah, oh, yeah. look, you already have one. I know. I know. I got an advanced copy, I guess. No, I, I bought it a while back. I love that. Awesome. Well, and then following up, Dan, this is kind of your bread and butter. Oh, look at all those researchers. I know. Look at all those people. Yeah. So this is going to be the research product showcase. We'll talk about some things that we've worked on and released, talk about some up things upcoming, and then we're going to dive into the product and give you live demos of some of these features as well, which I'm excited to do. Some of these have been maybe showcased. Others are going to be brand new and we're unveiling today on this uh, research Monday. So definitely tune into the research product showcase. It'll be an hour long, I'll host it. I'll be talking about uh, research edition communities. We'll have Nick Freiling on who is the director of our Insights Hub product. He'll be talking about that. I'll have Tim Cornelius come on, director of audience for Question Pro. And he'll be talking about a new product that we have called Instant Answers, which we'll, I don't wanna give it away. So we'll wait until 11 a.m., probably about 11.30 to talk more about instant answers and what that is. I know Crystal is excited about this. She's already been using it. So she's super pumped. So um, be on the lookout for that as well as Man, we go throughout the you day. You have to find out the important things in life, like who puts their milk in a cereal bowl before they put cereal in. No, that's very important. I've always wondered that, you know. Uh, my 11 year old niece was the one that had me field that. And because she puts milk in first. I think one you asked the other day was, is a Pop-Tart a calzone? Is that right? Yeah, it is. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> Technically, it's also a large ravioli. <laughs> but you can also ask other questions too. It doesn't have to be all <laughs> kind of, you know, fun, but it can be fun. You know, so, And then we're going to have Tim come on and talk about engaging the next generation of panelists, really about DEI for surveys. This is kind of a parlay from a talk that he gave at IIEX, which was really well received and very, um, I think, apropos to the times as well. So Tim will be coming on talking about that, which we're excited about. And then I'm going to be rounding out the day. Oh, yeah. Go ahead, Crystal. No, that was, oh. I'm just going to tell you to move on. Oh, okay. I got it. I, I'm, getting, I'm getting the cues here, okay? Um, and then I'm going to talk about five things you probably didn't know you could do with Question Pro. Some are, you may know, but others I just want to sort of highlight. So I'm excited to be rounding out the day with that. And then we'll wrap up about 
uh, one o'clock today. Yeah. So if you did not, you know, TLDR. Oh, and then leave us a, if you love using question pro, leave us a review. I will personally send you a $25 gift card. Um, and too long didn't listen, stick around. We got tons of stuff going on. We got Tim, Dan, uh, Nick, Dan and Tim, Matt, and everybody who comes to Matt's talk gets a free copy of his book. So we would love to have you here. And most importantly, my friends, make sure to get your free Starbucks. Yes. Get your Starbucks. <laughs> I, we will be popping this up all throughout the day because we know Starbucks just isn't for the morning. And we just love treating our customers and our friends. And we just cannot wait to be starting these next few days with you. If you didn't realize, Question Pro X Day is actually going to be three days this year. It's Research Monday, CX Tuesday, and Workforce Wednesday. So you'll get to see my face hosting every morning live for the next couple of days with different friends and colleagues from Question Pro nice. joining me as we talk about all the things. You know, just because Dan's coming first does not make him the most important. <laughs> <laughs> so make no. sure <laughs> make sure you stick around because we are so excited to have everyone here. Dan, any last minute comments before we start bringing no, in Matt? You know, I think just sit back, relax, use the comments to communicate with us, and we're excited to showcase what we have uh, today. So I think we can get going with Matt Seltzer. Give me one second. I'm going to try something new. Don't push the button. Okay. Right. <laughs> here we go. Hey, Dan. Matt, how are you, sir? Good morning. Good morning. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm excited for Research Monday, you know, so it's awesome. Absolutely. Are we live? Am I live? Yeah, we're live, man. We're live. That's fantastic. I've been watching. I didn't know if I was in the back room or not. This is going to be great. Yeah, you were in the back room, but then we brought you live. So it just oh, you made it happen. I know the magic of a button push, I guess. So um, I'll, I'll go ahead and introduce you, then we can get you going here, okay? Perfect. You're going to have to wish me luck on the screen share, too. But everyone on the audience, me too. But we're going to make this happen. All right. All right. Let's do it. Let's do it. So make sure, yeah, there's a QR code to get a complimentary copy of Matt's book, which I showed you here. So I've got it. I've read it. It's fantastic, as I've told Matt. And Matt has a copy, too. That's always good. So uh, for those of you that don't know Matt, he's a lifelong marketer. He started his career conducting market research for one of the most decorated ad agencies in, uh, in the Western U.S., he continued to maintain a steady freelance research career while simultaneously pursuing more direct marketing opportunities and also teaching college marketing courses. He has many accolades. I know he's a president of the AMA as well, or former president, Matt. You're kind I of going... just ended on uh, Thursday. Yeah, okay. my presidency. Awesome. So he did that. And Matt started S2 Research because he recognized a need for marketers and market researchers alike. Experience in both market research and marketing strategy, he saw that the head was not talking enough with the hand and realized that he could help serve as an effective translator between the two worlds. And I think that's really why we're excited to have Matt here today with Lead with Insights, because he can take not only the marketing research, but the marketing aspects, combine them and have it all make sense. So without further ado, Matt, I'll turn it over to you and you, the floor is yours. Wonderful, Dan. I truly, truly appreciate that. Um, that was kinder than anything I could say, so I'll take that. Uh, I believe you guys can see my screen now, so I am going to get into it. Um, so today we're talking about the muse, research's real role and outputs for infer inspiration. Let's make sure I get that PowerPoint thing going. There we go. So again, my name is Matt Seltzer. I'm a market research and marketing strategy consultant. I own a company called S2 Research. We're based down in Las Vegas, and we're the market research partner for marketers. And to really explain what that is kind of explains my background. Um, my background, exactly as you said, Dan, is in marketing and research. I've done both. And it's been my takeaway that those two worlds don't always communicate as well as they could, which really sucks because they can both benefit a lot when they communicate really well. Um, so again, I, I work in this marketing world where we help and provide marketing consult, uh, market research consulting. So if you're like me, and I guess a lot of people on this call probably are, you probably sit around thinking a lot, what is research's real role in the grand cosmos of marketing? Uh, and I've put a lot of thought into this question. Um, we, we tend to think our, our role is to inform, and it absolutely is as researchers. But the other piece that I don't ever want to forget about is that our, other, our role is also to inspire. Um, some of the greatest advertising in history, the greatest marketing history, came from market research, and it came from inspiration. 
And so you see kind of this ancient Greek theme going on. And that's because the more that I thought about this, the more I realized that we as market researchers are the muses. You know, if you, you go back to ancient Greece and you think about something like the Odyssey, that wasn't actually written by Homer. That was written by a muse, a creative entity that was kind enough to give their ideas to Homer. They were the inspiration for his incredible idea. When we think about all the different market research tools we have out there, and this does not encapsulate all of them, but think of these as the muses for marketing, because that is what we do. We're, um, we don't just inform, but we create the, the spark that helps marketers. And we, we can all think of great ideas in marketing that we love, great ads, great commercials, great strategies. All of those came from inspiration. And again, that inspiration, I'm going to argue here, is our role. And the muse doesn't just inspire uh, in one specific part of marketing. It inspires in every part of marketing. So pre-marketing, meaning before we've ever come up with our ideas, before we've ever gone to market, that's where we live. Mid-marketing. So we're talking actually intra-marketing. We're doing work. And still, research plays a role. And we're even going to talk about research in action as well today uh, because research plays an important role, especially now and in the future, that it didn't quite hold in marketing before. But let's talk about this pre-marketing piece before. And just to, to start, I'll give you a, a thought. It's one of my favorite thoughts about market research. If great advertising is an explosion, then insights are the match. You know, you think about it like a stick of dynamite or something. That dynamite, if that's your ad, that cannot explode without a spark, without a match, without a light. And that spark is us. So let me talk you through an example to explain that a little bit better. Let's say uh, you just had a hard workout. It's gladiator training season uh, and you got to get ready and you need to uh, you need to cool off after your workout. And what do you drink? The obvious answer, of course, it's milk. No, no, you're probably with me on that. That milk's not actually the best thing to be drinking uh, right after a, a hard workout. But why do we why did I say that well, it was because milk was actually marketed this way for a very long time. For anyone who remembers the late 80s, early 90s, milk, it does a body good. Um, that was a real campaign. And as a result of that campaign, uh, milk sales were actually down. So how did it get this way? How did we get to a point where we were saying milk, it does a body good? You, you, we used to see actual people sprinting marathons and then they'd be dripping milk afterwards like a Gatorade commercial. That's really how the ads were. How did we get this way? Well, it's because of some natural assumptions. First off, everyone knows that if you want to get stronger, you need some protein. And when you give that information to a team of top copywriters, you get the tagline milk. It does a body good. So it's pretty obvious how we got here. But the problem is that health, that factor of health is not the buying trigger. So we as market researchers, we dive into psychology a lot and we understand how inner, inner workings of, of buyers shopping habits ha uh, work. And health, again, is not actually a factor in that. So what are, what are the factors? Well, a team of real market researchers in the early 90s actually went out and asked this question to real audience members. They said, why do you buy milk? And they got a lot of different answers. First off, most of them said right away, I don't know if I have it. So even if you have milk in the, the fridge, you think uh, maybe you don't. And that's enough worry that you might want to go buy milk. Even if you do have it, you're not sure if it's still good. You know, milk holds that that spark of Shoot, this this may have it might be too old. No one actually knows what bad milk smells like, good milk, milk smells like. So again, there's that thought. And then, you know, even if you had it, you left the house this morning, you saw milk in the fridge, but maybe the kids put it in their cereal right before gladiator training. Um, by the way, always put the cereal first, then the milk, otherwise it's gonna splash. Uh, we'll get to that in the, the comments later. But uh these are real reasons why you might go out and buy milk. And now we call this qualitative research. These were real questions that were really asked of people. But here's the important part. When you take those incredible insights, those pieces of information that say, this is why people buy milk. You might not have it. I'm not sure if it's good enough. And you give that to a team of copywriters, you get one of the most pivotal marketing campaigns in the history of the world. Got milk. You know, Everyone knows Got Milk. Got Milk is still used today. What makes amazing sense to me, though, is that is two syllables right there. Got Milk. And it's completely built. It's a complete summarization of all those market research insights we just showed uh, were uncovered, that we all know how to uncover. This right here is the epitome of research working with marketing. We took everything we know and a team of copywriters boiled it down into something that literally changed the planet and very literally changed milk sales. So 
That's our example of pre-marketing. So we're coming up with a brand new campaign in that example. But what if you don't need a new campaign? What if you're already marketing and you want to use market research to make your marketing better? Well, there's this is a real thing that happens all the time. And let me give you an example right now. Let's say you have a coffee shop and it's a pretty successful coffee shop. You've got people lined up out the door. But it is a competitive marketplace out there. People's interests fade and wane and change. And you want to remain competitive. So how do you make your coffee shop better? As a business owner, as a marketer, there are two ways that you can do this. First off, you can guess. And I, I think Crystal and Dan, you both have heard me say this before, but I've made enough wrong decisions in my life that I would rather trust data. And on the topic of data, the other thing that you could do is ask. You can ask your audience how to make your coffee shop better. And this is actually a real example that was done by Starbucks uh, around 2007, 2008 with Starbucks Transformation Agenda. So in 2008, Starbucks launched the What's Your Starbucks idea? And it's a survey. It is literally a survey that asks audience members, the whole Starbucks audience, what could we do to make Starbucks better for you? And they had over 150,000 ideas submitted. Um, We'll talk about the results really, really fast in a sec, but I want to make sure you understand that's a survey. It's a form, but it asks a question and it asks a few questions. We ask some demo questions in there, but we also more importantly ask, what do you want to see? And we as market researchers and survey users and statisticians know, well, we can match that up to see, well, what ideas are coming in the most? We can group them and start to see, well, this is what the overall audience really, really cares about. So what does the Starbucks overall audience really care about? Well, let's find out from those ideas. First off, like we said, more than 150,000 ideas were submitted. Uh, and from that, 277 new ideas were brought to life in Starbucks between 2008 and 2012. Now, again, we can all kind of understand there's a lot of data crunching there. But how amazing is it if you could say we brought more almost 300 new ideas to make our business slightly more incrementally better? And they were all sourced from real audience members. I mean, here's some of the ideas that came from this splash sticks came from this idea, which to me today, here we are about a decade later, are a staple of Starbucks now. Free Wi-Fi came from this. Happy Hour came from this. These are real, powerful, pivotal ideas that have kept a brand like Starbucks at the top of their game. And that's huge. I mean, we're talking from these ideas, almost $5 billion has been generated because Starbucks is better because it's better for the audience, because the audience used the tools to communicate with Starbucks and Starbucks's marketing team listen. Um, the other piece with that that we want to remember is that in marketing, it's always our job to talk to the audience, communicate with the audience, engage with the audience. And as researchers, we have those tools. This tool right here, submitting your idea to Starbucks, in addition to being a market research tool, was a marketing engagement tool. And that's where market research mid-marketing really has this powerful tool. You know, not only can we get insights to create new ways to experience our brands, our products, our clients' products, um, but we also can use our own actual tools to create a new marketing engagement. So when we send out a survey via email after a nonprofit charity event, that's another engagement point with that nonprofit's audience, as well as a research tool. That's the same thing we see in every industry that's using surveys, but not every industry is thinking of it as a marketing opportunity, and it absolutely is. So again, that's our mid-marketing examples. We've talked about pre-marketing coming up with a brand new idea, mid-marketing, implementing several new ideas to keep your marketing constantly at the top of its game. But what about research in action, which is a new piece, and maybe it's not that new, but it's something that we've really seen grow in the last few years. So let's talk about research in action, meaning research as an actual function of marketing, an actual tactic. So we have a tendency when we think about research and insights to think that our insights are only for our marketers, our clients, the real business people behind it. But what if we flip that on its head and thought for a moment about using real research insights to blow the, uh, blow the minds of our audiences as well, our marketing audiences, our clients, customers? Well, again, this is something that's really happening right now. And I'll tell you a story about my own company that we got to do last year. So last year, we were honored to work on an engagement ring market research study, and it was with for a company that actually insures engagement rings. So let me give you guys two quick facts just to set this story up for you. Uh, fact number one, 
diamonds, those big shiny things that go on top of engagement rings, those are listed as the hardest naturally occurring mineral on science's most scale of hardness. So the way science, is, science measures hardness, diamonds are at the top of that list. Fact number two, diamonds are 58 times harder than the next thing on that list. So think about this. Diamonds are top of the hardness scale and they're, the, they're 58 times harder than the next thing. I mean, that's pretty good. So let me ask you guys this question, pro users, which is stronger? a diamond or the Incredible Hulk? Now, I know it seems like a crazy question, um, but this is a real question that we actually put into the field uh, among a series of other things pertaining to uh, engagement rings. We ask people how they use their engagement ring, how often they wear it, how often they do things like open doors, work with tools, and of course, what did they think about the Incredible Hulk question? And why did we do this? What was the reasoning for it? Well. It's because I'm also a marketer and I wanted this headline right here to go at the top of a press release. 75% of men incorrectly believe their engagement ring is stronger than the Incredible Hulk. I'm going to tell you guys right now, engagement rings break a lot. It, it, there's a reason to insure them. And again, I've got a, uh, I could, I'm happy to put anyone who has an engagement ring in touch with a great company that can uh, help with that. But that's not the point here. The point is that this company wanted to share the statistics behind how easy it is to break your wedding ring, your engagement ring. And again, from all the tools examples, from how often people open doors, uh, which really is the real reasons that people break their engagement rings, um, we were able to publish that in a white paper. But that white paper wasn't going to get the attention it needed without a catchy headline, something that we could pitch to the media, something that we could send out in press releases and get at the top of newspapers and magazines. Uh, and this is traditional public relations work. But when we think about our role as market researchers, we had the power to come up with this statistic that 75% of men incorrectly believe the Incredible Hulk could uh, could totally not hold up to the diamond. Incredible Hulk will totally destroy your diamond ring. So definitely getting engaged or insured. But my point here is that we as market researchers are holding a role with the statistics, which are gravitating toward headlines. And headlines and content are a major component of modern marketing. PR content, social media content, digital content like blogs. If anyone here has ever worked with any type of marketer, they've heard someone mention this before. I need new social media content. I don't know what to write about on the blog this week. We have content. We have statistics. We have insights. We have data. We have myriad things that we can be used to create content headlines, to create social media posts, to create an entire article that can be push, uh, pushed or pitched to help your business or your brand get out there more in marketing. And that is entirely market research in action. With businesses uh, conducting primary market research surveys. Oh, sorry, I had a question in there. Um, I'll give you one other example. This is my company. We actually built a market research tool to help advertising agencies. And this is an internal tool where they can use their uh, answer a few questions, and then they actually actually get benchmark statistics against how they're doing to help them uh, learn more about themselves. And again, we think of this as a marketing tool as well as a market research tool. But the biggest thing is it's a content piece. It's something that uses our own market research skills to engage the audience. And shout out to Question Pro because we actually have that built on our website and it was built by Question or built in Question Pro. We're proud Question Pro users at S2 Research. So again, we've talked about the three different ways you can use marketing or market research overall in marketing. Um, there's one other piece I want to talk about, and that's inspiration. And this is going to be the last thing I talk about today. Um, so this right here is an example of how I believe most market researchers present market research. And I love this because I'm a market researcher and that actually kind of sucks for everyone else because most people that you're talking to aren't going to dig on this as much as possible or as much as we are. They're not market researchers. In fact, most marketing audiences I know find statistics and charts and graphs sleepworthy. Uh, I hate to use the word boring because, God, it's something I love. Great data viz is great. Um, but what marketers really need, these are action-driven people. They're out there uh, coming up with ideas, being creative, working with the media, buying, selling. They need something that moves them. And so we need to be thinking as market researchers, whenever we develop outputs, outputs for our market research, or, or market research how do we move our audiences? So I have a few examples here. We're not going to cover every single one of these. You might have heard of each of them, though. Personas, journey maps, dashboards, creative briefs, great presentations. Um, there's a lot of ways that we as market researchers can inspire marketers. Um, 
mentioned creative briefs a second ago. This is a real creative brief put on by or put out by Red Bull. So whenever you've seen a great ad that comes from Red Bull, those guys jumping out of the planes, this is it always starts with a piece of paper like this. Um, and I want to zoom in right here on this section about the target audience. So this is a real creative brief from Red Bull, and it says their target audience is middle-aged men and women reaching the midlife crisis aspect of their life. The next two sentences go on to express a little bit more about that audience. But here's where I want to challenge every researcher on this call right now. We know how to tell the story about middle-aged men and women reaching midlife crisis. We know how to tell the story about every audience because we know how to connect. We know how to dissect. We know how to ask the right questions and turn their answers back into real information that we can use. That means that we have the capability to write the best possible version of this paragraph. And this is a paragraph that goes on just about every creative brief you can imagine. Every creative brief says how your audience views your product, who influences them to use the product, what features they want, what they'll achieve. These are real story points that real marketers need to come up with great ideas, great strategies. But again, I'll point out, we as market researchers know how to tease this out better than anyone. We know how to go and actually get data. If we can't get data, we know how to actually talk to audiences and conduct IDIs and focus groups and any type of research. We can even do desk research. But the big thing is we know how to tell this story better than anyone. Our challenge is we need to write it in such a way that it inspires creativity. So creative writing, in, uh, a lot of passion, a lot of emotion in our writing, that's what takes it to the next level. Uh, journey maps, I mentioned this a second ago, but let me just kind of explain it a little bit. So there's a truth in marketing that the moment someone, uh, just because we find someone who wants to be your customer, doesn't mean they, they're ready to be your customer that day. There's a process that we all go through in marketing that we call journey mapping, where we become aware of a product and then we learn about the product and gain trust with it and interest. And eventually we slowly engage. Now, how we talk to audiences, we as marketers talk to audiences at every phase in that journey is different. It must be different. And again, that's the truth of marketing. But again, I'll point out, we as market researchers know how to tease this out better than anyone. We know how to understand what's going through an audience's mind before a purchase, when they're considering a purchase, after purchasing, every step in the journey. We even know how to follow up with them after to see how that experience matched up to what they were told. And all of that, again, is a strength that we have. What we must do is instead of producing the statistics and the charts is tell a great story, create a great journey map. And again, we have that power. It's up to us to create that tool. Because again, if we don't, we're just going to be putting our audience to sleep. And the last thing I want to explain is dashboards, um, because dashboards to me are really something that are going to be the future of the survey industry. Um, I'll give you an example. We got to partner with uh, our friends over at Mantis Research uh, to help them publish uh, the survey results of a global community study of nonprofits. So here we've got nonprofit agencies. We really want them to use the data and information in this survey. The problem is there's many different types of nonprofit agencies out there with different online communities. So what we did is we made all the results interactive in a dashboard format. So what you can see right here is uh, the a version of this, uh, the dashboard that's embedded on my company's website. Uh, and all you have to do is create a lookalike audience by clicking any of those filters. So how many employees do you have? What's uh, the, the number of community members you have? What's your primary function? And all of a sudden, the survey results below it will update to match your exact situation. Now, all of a sudden, we've created market research reports in the same way that we're doing now, but we're making them one, direct to the audience. They can see exactly the type of person or type of audience or type of results that they want to see. And two, they get to discover it themselves. And that's probably the biggest thing that I, I like about dashboards is dashboards put the power of data in the hands of clients. Um, that means that clients are the ones uncovering their own insights. And again, I said at the beginning, our job is to take insights and make them in such a way that they're inspirational. The absolute best way that you can do that is to have a client discover the insights, get excited about the insights themselves, dive into it. And dashboards absolutely allow us to do that. But I bring this up because that is another output that we may not be doing as market researchers right now, but it absolutely creates inspirational moments. So just to kind of recap everything that I've talked about, and I wanted to make sure we have some time for questions after this as well. 
First off, um, market research fits into every phase of marketing. So pre-marketing, when we're just coming up with a brand new idea or we need to revamp a whole campaign. So Got Milk is our example there, where we talked about real audience members giving real qualitative research back, real feedback back, that ultimately was boiled down into two syllables, Got Milk. And all of a sudden, the whole world changed. Mid-marketing, where we're actually talking to real audience members in our marketing it's an engagement tool, but more importantly, it's a way to create better marketing. Starbucks was that example where they asked uh, and received over 150,000 ideas. And when they quantified those ideas and parsed them by audience and ethnography and every way that you can, can conceive, you could see what Starbucks really needed to remain ahead. And again, I'll point out uh, uh, the spill lids came from that. I mean, that's huge to me. And research and action. So again, we tend to think of market research as this thing that takes place behind the scenes, but really us as researchers have just as much of a role in marketing as copywriters, as social media strategists, as PR planners, as media buyers, as everyone in marketing, because we create content. We create topics to talk about. And all of that you're going to find is a huge part of marketing and marketing in the future. And of course, we need to create outputs that inspire. That's probably the most important thing that I can stress from this conversation is whatever we give to our market research audiences. So whoever comes to us and says, I have this question, can you research it for me? We can't just give them back something that they won't read or won't resonate with them. But marketing audiences really do use personas today. They use journey maps. They use uh, creative briefs. They love presentations. A lot of audience or a lot of People who have questions want to hear a great presentation from a great market researcher who's dived into the data for weeks and can communicate all the facets, can run the ad hoc analyses when the questions come up. You want to blow someone's mind, be ready to talk through what you've learned with them. That's how we create inspiration from our research. So uh, I just want to remind everyone, I did totally write a book. Uh, we can see it right here. It's big and purple. And fun fact, that's my mom's favorite color. That's why it's purple. Um, it is called The Creative Catalyst, and it tells a lot of the stories uh, and more of the stories that really got me to thinking about this market research concept uh, as existing for the purpose of generating creativity, inspiring. We tend to think of the best marketing in history as being creative and clever. And likewise, we tend to know that the most creative and clever ideas are backed by insight, or better yet, backed by inspiration. And you notice those two words are very similar. There's a reason for that. Um, this is our role as researchers is to inspire. And again, the book will tell you a lot of different ways to do that. But more importantly, it'll give you many, many different stories. As you guys can see, I love my stories uh, that help you understand how other researchers have done this in the past and how you can take those same ideas and move it forward for you. So I want to thank everyone so much for your time this morning. Uh, we did reserve a little time for questions uh, here, but I just want to have this QR code up as well. If you'd like to check out my website, if you'd like to connect, connect with me on LinkedIn, uh, whatever you would like to do. But thank you guys so much. And I really hope, uh, hope everyone dug this. Hey, Matt, thanks so much. Oh, no, Dan's face. <laughs> thank oh, you no. so much. <laughs> Hold on. I got to find Dan. <laughs> Found you. Dan, you're muted. Dan, you're muted. Dan, you're muted. Well, Crystal, thank you. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Matt. That was awesome. Absolutely. I assume everyone got the website, but it's s2research.com. I'm just going to stop the share there. Uh, no, thank you guys so much. This was cool. Uh, I didn't even get to mention it, by the way. I got my superhero background behind me. I got Superman. I got Star Wars, everything. So this is a good day. Nice. That's perfect. Yeah, I like that. That's awesome. Yeah. No, we did have some questions that come in, but at first I just wanted to make a comment um, and actually a question that I had. You mentioned you know, everything from journey mapping to dashboards and things. Which one of those do you think is best to help communicate research results to a marketer and help get those insights um, into the right hands? Like, is any one of those better than the other? Or do they all kind of serve an individual purpose? They all serve an individual purpose. And that's something that we always think about whenever we start a project is who's going to be using this and how. Uh, and then we kind of back into it. I almost said creative briefs there when you asked that question. I thought about it mm -hmm. for a sec. And I say that because I... I really like the idea of a creative brief. Right. Uh, for those who don't know creative briefs, I mean, they really are. You teach them at copywriting school. Miami Ad School does amazing uh, creative brief teaching. And I say that because that's how real marketing campaigns start on a piece of paper like that. 
And again, I argue we're better equipped than anyone to do that. But to, again, like I said, I always ask, what are you using this for and who's using it? Uh, and sometimes, and this is a big one for me, you've got a senior, senior person up there who needs their the research insights. And the thing I found with senior, senior people, they don't have any time. Mm -hmm. um, there's a reason that every market research report I've ever written uh, has an executive summary in the beginning, because I know that's as far as they're going. But let me give you a, uh, oh, I don't have the statistic in front of me. Shoot. A sizable share of <laughs> senior level leaders across the country in the U.S. listen to podcasts regularly. Uh, we know this. This is this is actually proven. And mm -hmm. I say this, um, well, I say for two reasons. One, it, it says a lot about who they are. It also explains how they consume new information because maybe they don't have time, but if they're on the go, a lot of that listen time I know is during workout times and on, on commutes. So I bring this up because we've actually had some luck turning our executive summaries into 10 minute podcasts. And if I've got to give a senior level, uh, a leader, they, they've got 10 minutes and they won't read anything that I give them. I just know for a fact they won't. Well, what can I give them that they will listen to or that they will consume? So podcasts have worked out real well for us in that uh, regard, but I figured I, you'd kind of dig that. Yeah, no, I like that. The podcast is great. So I think we even do some of the same things even with our content because it just depends on how people want to listen to it, right? They need that variety. And I, I love this because essentially like if you do research and you're not able to communicate the results, it's worthless, right? You wasted a lot of money. So you need to get into the right hands via yep. any of those any of those methods that you mentioned. So we had a few questions come in. I know, was there anyone we wanted to start with? Okay, perfect. So Matt, how do you engage marketers who are skeptical about the value of insights market research? Um, there's two, two answers to that, but they're actually both going to be summarized as you've got to blow their minds. Mm. Um, but, uh, how do you engage with someone who's skeptical? So first off, I love to bring, uh, marketers into the research process. Qual is really good for this. So if you can actually get a marketer to come sit behind the glass while you're conducting a focus group, mm -hmm. I guarantee they're going to come away blown away by research. They're going to be like, oh, this is, I get it now. Um, my favorite, I used to have, I had, I've had the earpiece in before and I've had, uh, uh, someone in the background who was totally not on board an hour ago, asking me questions to ask the focus group <laughs> and you get goosebumps from it. Cause you're like, okay, they, they get it. They get what we're doing here. Um, so I say that cause that's intra, you know, you're, we're doing research right. and that's a great way to get buy-in. Um, but the other piece is after the fact. So when we're presenting research, if we know skeptical people are out there or we know someone has real challenges with either conceiving this or they just hurdles in marketing in general, if we can present solutions or we can present an insight that genuinely makes their eyebrow go up, I can't mm -hmm. actually do that on command. I have to. Um, <laughs> so uh, that's how you, I mean, I mentioned goosebumps a second ago. If you can give someone goosebumps with something you said, that's how you get them on board. Mm -hmm. And all I've, I've found this consistently, all someone needs to do is see the results work once. Uh, once they, they have that idea, that, that pivot point, that anything that came from, I hate to use stats all the time. I love statistics, but Qual has a huge part of this too. Uh, but once you give them that insight, that they go, "Oh, they're they're like I mean, they're they're uh, they're hooked for life." And those end up being some of the strongest marketers. They go into bigger ad agencies. They go into bigger marketing teams that you find out actually have research in house, and they keep relying on it. It's it's kind of like an ecosystem, but it has mm -hmm. to start with that blowing their mind phase. Interesting. I like that. I like that. What are Crystal? Do some more questions that came in, or yeah, there is a bunch of good ones. Like, awesome. well, so many. I have so many thoughts about the Starbucks thing because I worked there for seven years during two thousand seven when oh, yeah? they came out with all those ideas, and some of them did not hit. Let me tell you. No, they didn't. <laughs> As a barista who actually worked at the Starbucks, we had a lot of contrary ideas. Um, but I, <laughs> I guess the another question is. Do consumers always know what's best? No. No. I wish wow. I wish I, I wish I waited longer on that. No, they absolutely <laughs> don't always. Um, and so, again, I, I'm sure a lot of folks on this call are in a similar boat. I've, I've got a background in marketing and psychology, mm -hmm. and I bring that up because the psychology part is really how that's such an important thing for us to consider as we build any research tools. Um, you know, we talk about survey design in my office a lot, and we talk about kind of this funnel approach. And we say, okay, beginning of the survey, you can ask anything. And the reason we say that we call we call the the, the respondent a blank slate at that point. Um, 
by the end of the survey, that's when we can mention our brand, the brand that we're actually researching. Um, I say this because that's the phase where we say we've, we've shown our hand. I can't ask that brand specific question in the very beginning. This is very general, by the way, but it all has to do with the fact that everything that I do in my research is a stimulus that affects the outcome of the next question. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. consumers don't always know what they want. You, you can't ask someone, how do you think this thing you've never tasted is going to taste um, and be accurate by it? I say that because that's actually kind of a cool question. I'd love to know. But, um, but what we know, we can ask a lot of things if we ask them the right way. So that's the other piece. It, it's important to have a background in marketing when we're doing this or have marketers involved as we're building our tools because they know the right language. They know the right thinking that we're trying to dissect. They may not even know that dissecting it is a thing that we can do, but they are thinking about journey maps. They are thinking about how do we talk to someone at the beginning when they've never even heard of our brand as opposed to the end when they've signed up for our newsletter, they've talked to the salesperson, they're thinking about making that purchase. But those two people are very different. And marketers know we have to communicate different with them. Research works the exact same way. We have to be thinking very, very specifically, how is what we're doing impacting the results we're getting back? I mean, that's science and we know that, but that, that is the role we play. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think what's it, you brought up an interesting point, Matt, that I think kind of parlayed from the, the question we had before is that I think getting the marketers involved in the research process initially and getting their buy-in, that might be another way to kind of help get get them more involved in the process, right? And and wanting to use the results and not kind of dismissing it. So that's, I like that point too. Totally, totally. Awesome. So we have another question that came in from Zachary here. Can you talk a little bit about the difference between creating a story for your clients and allowing them to self-discover insights? So that's a great question. Um, first off, I, I believe that self-discovery piece is going to continue to grow in our, uh, as we keep growing as an industry. Mm -hmm. um, really the best way to do that right now is the dashboard concept because it's the most user-friendly. Uh, I say that because I've had clients who like, databases and I've sent it to them. They're not building dashboards, but they get just as into it because they happen to have that skill set or that knowledge. So right. uh, this balance that you're asking about is going to change. Um, our role right now, I would argue, is 95% to tell the story. We are the muse. We That really is not only where we have opportunity to grow as an industry and continue mm -hmm. to, to establish the value that we bring, um, but also all the tools are not there yet to just let, let the reins go. Um, and I don't think we're doing it at the full capacity. I mean, again, all the data that's out there, all the research, every researcher on this call, I mean, if you were to add up all the different data sources and data we have, we could tell, answer any question we wanted. Um, that's the power we have. And telling creative, powerful, inspirational stories, that's our role. That's never gonna change. Um, I, again, I say the balance is going to change though, because as more tools come about that create automation, that create interactivity for our clients, it's up to us then to think more about those tools. And I say that because I think dashboards arguably are a little archaic mm -hmm. in the sense that they're still just a sheet filled with graphs and charts. Um, it'd be great if a computer could actually read back uh, the one powerful insight to me in a language that, I mean, us, you actually get Siri on there or Alexa, both are in my room, so they're going to say something, um, to tell it to you. I mean, that'd be wonderful, but we're not there yet, but it right. will get there. Um, and it's up to researchers to be thinking as we see these tools kind of come online, can that one help my clients and then become the expert in that, mm -hmm. uh, start delivering even cooler things in that, that, that niche or that genre of, we got, we built the Alexa app that'll communicate your insights to you. I mean, that would be cool, but we're not there yet. So again, 95%, it's still on us to tell the story, but our industry is going to keep growing and changing. It's cool. Yeah. That might be on our robot roadmap next year in the product, you know, have built an Alexa app to, to just say the results back to you. So oh, it's kind of just, roadmap. thanks. Oh, no, no. I just, then it's like, then there's too much AI involved and like you take, then everyone's going to have the same insight. And there's the challenge. Mm -hmm. It's like with Canva and the design aspect of marketing, everyone kind of has the same designs now because we all use the same tools. 
So you're exactly right. And it's going to be really cool when that comes full circle, when everyone has the exact same insights. So then you got one company that says, well, what if we just go find a, a, a research firm and we conduct our own primary? And now they're different again. And it all, it <laughs> <laughs> okay, we've got a few more questions. This I think, this I find interesting because I had to explain to my family over Memorial Day weekend what my job is now. And of course you get the classic like polling is inaccurate and like mm -hmm. blah, blah, mm -hmm. blah, 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 blah. So <laughs> how do you, uh, how yeah. do you go about this, Matt? Yeah, it's a great question because um, you got kind of the double whammy there that you're dealing with. Um, one, and I maybe I've just been lucky, but I've been doing this a long time. I have never conducted a study, any kind of study, that there wasn't at least one thing that wowed me. Um, so I say that because I'm pretty good. I like to tell that wow part of the story somewhere in the story, no matter what. That at least always gets the buy-in. Even if the results aren't what the client wanted and they had some doubt, I could still show statistical confidence behind something that wows them. But let's say I can't um, you're going to probably be fighting a losing battle, but, and this is where I'll really kind of think of it holistically. I don't work with a lot of clients that really doubt research methodology. Um, mm -hmm. it, part of it is one of the reasons that they work with a team like mine is this is already in their mind. They either want to take it for a spin or they've had good luck in the past. And they're, uh, this is something they either, they know a little bit about, um, I have worked with some teams that have had the doubt. And if that double whammy, they're probably going to be polite. And we probably won't work together after that. Right. <laughs> right. It makes sense. But Matt, I think a lot of time what happens is people have an idea of the results of how they'll come out. Right. And if it's, yeah. if it's different from what they want or they're expecting, I mean, we should be doing research not to validate our own opinions, but to get new opinions and right. But oftentimes the inverse is true. So I think that might come up sometimes in, in your results were like, no, no, it's got to be this way, but it's and not. That's, so. And that honesty is the best way. I mean, really, at the end of the day, what our what we're doing is we're answering questions. Mm -hmm. um, you are, your answer may come back definitively different than their hypothesis. Right. But right. if it's definitively different, we got to be able to communicate that. And sometimes those are hard conversations to have. Uh, sometimes they're actually enlightening. Uh, I am always find it funny how often we actually do confirm hypotheses in our research. And in my head, I'm thinking, okay, we just wasted the client's time. They already knew this. But actually, when I go and tell them that, they go, you know what, we've thought about this for a while, but just knowing that the data agrees, now we feel better going to market. And so I never know what people are thinking. Um, yeah. Again, I'll go back. It's one of the reasons I've made enough wrong decisions in my life that I'd much rather just <laughs> trust data. And that's exactly what we're right. doing here. So if, if, if you have to, be honest. What I can't ever recommend, though, is picking data that confirms something and just calling it good there. We've all mm -hmm. seen that. We've all heard of that. It destroys the integrity of what we do. And I'm a big integrity guy. Mm -hmm. um, but the other side is that's how we create distrust of research. That's that's actually the slippery slope that we need to stay aware of. Being honest with our data. I mean, at the end of the day, and I always tell people this, you know, this isn't my opinion. This is what the data says. Right, right. And, and, and I mean, maybe fine. They're going to yell at the research report. They don't get to yell at me. Um, it's a good data. <laughs> don't don't kill yeah, the messenger, right? Don't kill the messenger. That's exactly <laughs> it. Yeah. I think there was a good question that came in, Crystal, from, oh, you, you queued this it one? up. Perfect. Yeah, that one. Um, so what's the time frame for evaluating success or lack thereof of marketing campaigns? You do the research. Hopefully mm -hmm. that informs your marketing campaign. What's the time frame of success? I think this kind of goes back to what piqued my interest was the got milk example, where you said actually milk sales went down. If I'm if I'm remembering what you said correctly, it does so body good. Yeah, exactly. So I think this is kind of interesting, and I hope that you can um, answer this question here for us, Matt. Absolutely. Um, it's going to depend from situation to situation. Let's think about that journey map example I gave a second ago. Mm -hmm. um, there have been proven case studies where a bill, the right billboard at the right freeway exit will sell more cheeseburgers. We, we know this. It just has to do with commute times. It has to do with hunger. It has to do with the location. Um, separately, that I mean, that's B2C in a very specific example. Separately, let's talk B2B software sales. You guys know anything about that industry? Uh, maybe uh, a little bit here and there. Yeah. <laughs> so you think about 
I don't care where you put that billboard. You won't sell a single software through one billboard at the right exit. It's just not the right strategy. Mm. And separately from that, you have to think, well, that journey map, how do people make decisions about software? There's an evaluation process. There's an, uh, a discovery process that has to take place first. Um, there's an example I always give from McDonald's that, uh, you know, all the marketing you do uh, towards kids with Ronald McDonald can't sell any uh, chicken nuggets unless you sell the parents on lunch too, because the parents are the one with money. Well, the same thing's true in B2B sales, because if you're talking to someone who has absolutely no buying power and they're on board, they still have an entire uphill battle that they need to fight internally. And I say all this because as we map out how long a journey might take, it might be as long as 30 seconds from seeing a billboard and making a right on the freeway, or mm -hmm. it might be six months to two years. What's important to know is from a research standpoint, because we can help with this, um, is understand what does that regular timeline look like? Mm -hmm. And then you can actually set a, a KPI to speed it up. Yeah. Um, but that's how you can evaluate something. If you know the average selling cycle of your product is three months, evaluating the success in one month is just doing yourself a disservice. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I think so, that's a that's a great yeah. point. I think it's knowing that the buying cycle, I think it's, it's perfect because mm -hmm. I think about like, I don't really like, so Bucky's is like a big, you know, it's like a big car. Yeah, like, Bucky's, yeah. Yeah, Bucky's. Okay. So, you know, I don't really think about Bucky's unless I'm on, you know, the 35, like headed somewhere and I see like 18 billboards leading up to Bucky's. I'm like, oh, huh, maybe I do need that brisket sandwich or and some gas, you yeah. know? So it, it's so true that like it doesn't really influence my buying decision unless I'm there and mm -hmm. like, you know, going to my destination in that case. So likewise, I mean, you know, you were kind of joking that we might know something about, you know, B2B kind of SaaS sales and the buying cycle is like longer there naturally. So to your point, if like we try to evaluate something in two weeks, well, it's probably not the best time frame. So I, I thought that answer was great that you gave. Mm -hmm. I have my moments. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, after this, this is it's Monday. These are all the moments I have all week. Sorry, yeah, everybody. Oh, no. That's, <laughs> that's literally the conversation I had this morning with my wife, too. That's funny. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, there is one of our guys ask a question that I thought was really interesting coming from a background in advertising houses, especially. I had I have never worked with a marketing agency that had a market research team in house. So now that seems bad now. <laughs> <laughs> so I first and foremost think it's a good thing. I'm going to be the, I'm also incredibly biased. <laughs> um, I've just, I've seen it work so well when it does work that I don't understand why every marketing team doesn't have insights in house. Now that said, I actually do know why every marketing team doesn't have insights in house. Um, and a lot of it has to do with cost. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, it's expensive to keep a market researcher employed full time. And if you're a marketing agency of 10 people, unless you're thinking about that, uh, kind of some of the things we talked about today where your research is part of your content and how you can, um, it might be hard to keep that person employed full time. Mm -hmm. And so actually there's a reason in advertising agencies globally, you really don't start seeing insights people until you hit about the 50 employee mark. Interesting. Um, and separately, any agency that you see that has 500 employees or more, and these are some of the biggest global agencies. I don't want to call anyone out. They're, they're awesome teams though. They do have research teams in house. Um, but I bring that up because those are actually, marketing agencies. I mean, they exist to create marketing for other entities. There's also in-house marketing teams at companies. Um, I have a client that has more researchers than I've ever seen at any entity ever. It's incredibly integrated with marketing. I have another client who's incredibly comparative to them. Uh, they have no market researchers. So mm -hmm. there's a very kind of disparity, big disparity there when it comes to in-house marketing teams. And then the, the last example I'll just give, because this one always blew my mind, is I knew a great researcher uh, at a car manufacturer and I asked him for a long time because he was telling me the exciting stuff that they're researching about demand, about safety wants. Um, I mean, really consumer research. And I said, well, what does your marketing team think of this? He goes, we don't, we don't do anything with marketing. We, we are only on product design. Hmm. So, so here's a full insights department that's helping this company that's not even touching marketing. And right, it seemed right. like a missed opportunity for me. I'm sure they've, they've got a strategy behind it, but Research hasn't really found its home yet in the world in general and in marketing in general, but it's getting there. Hmm. I think it kind of depends probably, like you were saying, Matt, around the organization itself, right? And their maybe their philosophy and how they operate because 
I mean, some I think do, like you mentioned, and some don't, but it's interesting there's not more of like um, more, some more commonplace or like this is the kind of the template that all these companies follow. Like it is really dispersed based on the company. So that's interesting. Yeah. Huh. I will tell you a statistic though, um, and I ran this about two years ago, so it's probably time to refresh it. But <laughs> like I said, most, most ad agencies, especially the smaller ones, don't have uh, a research team. But 95% of advertising agency clients think their agency does. Oh, interesting. Huh. Yeah. I, I went out and found that and they, and we, we teased it out a few different ways, but they said, if you had to get a survey done, who would you call? My market research agency or my marketing agency. Um, if you wanted to do focus groups, if you were setting up a new campaign, who would you call? My marketing agency. And then we said, does your agency have a market research team? 95% of people said yes. There, the, the, the numbers aren't there. They do, that isn't the same share that has a research team. Um, but it aligns so well with how people think about, I say people because business owners, um, consumers, it's how they think about marketing. They think right. everything's predicated by data and research. Mm -hmm. And we can show you the best and strongest actually is. Um, right. So there's right. a, a natural alignment there. And I think, too, if you're in the industry like, you know, like we are, I always think, well, of course, everything's informed by data, you know, and, and research. But in reality, there's probably a lot of decisions and things that get made that that isn't. So it, it's it's interesting. I think if you pull your head up out of the weeds, you know, it's kind of you'll, you'll get some different results. So, Crystal, yeah. <laughs> um, I have one final question, Matt. Sure. As asked by some of our team, we see that you have Star yes. Wars posters. I was hoping you we were going to ask this question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> In what order should people watch the Star Wars movies? And have you ran a survey on it? I have not ran a survey on it. I kind of want to use your new tool. Um, okay, so I'm actually debating this right now with my own children because they've never seen any. They're at the age. And I think we're going to do release order. Mm. Um. There's an order I came up with a few years ago, though, called Days of Future Past Order. Oh. And I firmly, oh, yeah. It's took a so way it's, more it's, serious turn than oh, I Oh, I know. <laughs> it's 145236. I'll leave it at that because I know we're on time. One, so, so Phantom three. Menace. I got to write this down. Yeah. <laughs> one, well, he said 145. 145. Yeah. And then 236. Two, so three, we get introduced to this wholesome little boy. And then we flash forward. Now there's an an evil empire. The boy's dead. He's got there's a son named Luke. Obi Wan's an old. We don't know what happened. So we see four and five. We find out that Vader's his dad. I know there's, there's spoilers here. What happened? Interesting. What do you call this order again? I got Days of Future Past order, which is right. based on a, a that's an X Men comic title. Uh, Yes, I, I saw. I get you. I see you. Like, oh, yeah. I'm tracking. Yeah, all right. All right. Um, well, that's awesome, Matt. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. I appreciate this, guys. And yeah, I'll thanks, Matt. Touch soon. Have fun next day, everyone. Thank yes. you. Yeah. Thank you. Bye, thank Matt. You. Bye, everyone. That was awesome. I know. I'm a days of future past order. I like that. <laughs> I know that. I was not expecting that to take such a uh, actual I know. turn. <laughs> I mean, there's. I didn't realize there's all these different theories of like how you can watch it. So we're getting a lot of good comments in. You know, great presentation, Matt. I think Matt's book is even going to Japan or a Kindle copy is going a to Kindle Japan. A Kindle copy at least. And so yeah, here, so I'll put awful. it down there again. Oh, I covered up your name. Everybody knows who you are, Dan. Don't yeah. forget to um, <laughs> get a copy of Matt's book. We are so grateful to have him here for X Day, The Creative Catalyst. And yeah. if you had to jump halfway through the presentation or I hear there's some LinkedIn is down. So yeah. if you were watching us and couldn't, don't worry if you've signed up for and pre-registered for X Day, you'll be getting a um, all of this content in an email. And I am going to leave that survey open for about 24 hours. So if you come back and watch it, you're more than happy to get Matt's book. We are so happy to support him and all the work he's doing. And if you, you know, heard halfway through there, he is a huge question pro user. <laughs> Yeah, he is. Yep, yep. So this isn't, you know, we love Matt and um, think that he is just great. And um, make sure you guys get your Starbucks. 
Make sure you tell us where you're from in the comments. I know we have somebody joining from Japan. Yeah, we have awesome. people from all over Canada. Um, and oh, they made the star the Star Wars made it into the comments. Oh, it did. Nice. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> um, and so we are just so thankful that all of you are joining us across Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, and YouTube. And now what do we have up next? Yeah, up next, I know we're going to be doing the, the product showcase here with myself, Nick Freiling, the director of Inside Sub, and Tim Cornelius, director of Audience, unveiling some new, new features and functionality that we are releasing here at Question Pro. So we'll be doing that. And then after that, Tim will be talking about DEI and surveys and inclusion. And this is kind of, if you were at IEX in, was that April, I believe, a couple mm -hmm. months ago, we, Tim talked about it, got a lot of good, I think, good press, good um, good buzz around it. So he's going to be talking about that. Obviously, it's really, you know, to the times right now, it's super important. And there's not a lot of people talking about it. So I think I'm proud that Tim is taking the reins there and really pushing this out in the industry. And then I'll be rounding out the day with five things you probably didn't know you could do with Question Pro. Some you might not know, but maybe <laughs> the depths, the depths of what uh, of what you can do. Perhaps you didn't know that. So we'll be getting into that. I'm going to keep it. Some of them are a little heavy, some are light. So kind of playing to the audience here. And that is what we'll be doing today. So I think we'll get started here in a few minutes. And oh yeah, yeah. go ahead, Crystal. I know, just waiting for the boys to get their cameras turned on and mics on in the background. So we will be, oh, Barbados, look at all these people. Virginia, Bangladesh, Mexico. Nice. Laura, nice. I thought you lived in New York. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, as, as, uh, as we've said, Dan and I are both in Austin, Texas. And so if you're going to be down here for TMRE in in San Antonio in November, or if you're going to be out in Quirks in uh, July in New York, please let us know. We'd love to see you. If you're ever in Austin, let us know. We are always happy to show off our city or our suburb. <clears throat> Dan. Yeah, I'll show and you Round <laughs> Rock. Yeah. All the great things Round Rock has to offer. <laughs> uh, I drove through Round Rock yesterday or on Saturday and thought of you. See, there and you go. <laughs> that's all. That's my story. <laughs> um, and then please make sure that you take advantage of our coffee giveaway. Yes. Because everybody loves a free Starbucks. And uh, you know, it's pretty exciting. What um Crystal, you know, you, you mentioned Quirks in July. We're actually giving away a Quirks oh. ticket. So maybe this is a good time to kind of bring that up or at least tease it. I know you can win two or what is that? We're we giving away I two. I know. I'm one? trying to find the white one. Oh, there we go. Nope, they're not oh. working. <laughs> this is going very poorly. Tom <laughs> Join us tomorrow and these overlays yeah, will look 10 this times up. better. <laughs> so we're, we're giving a, a ticket away to Quirks, New York. So um, if you're online, obviously you can click that link and mm -hmm. or there's the QR code up in the corner or down below. Um, you'll find it. Maybe we can just remove this. Here. Uh, hide that. Click the, scan that and enter to win a free um, Quirks ticket on us. There we yeah. go. Yeah, nice. <laughs> there it is. Yeah. Man, I, like Woo. I, am a, I was like, the QR codes are such a great idea. The words you cannot see depending. Um, <laughs> You just got to get on the blue background. This is perfect. This so, is okay. This is, you know, research is getting all the, the kinks out for CX Day tomorrow. Please make sure you join us for CX Tuesday and Workforce Wednesday as we keep X Day rolling this week. And uh, I think, you know, as we get ready to roll into the 11th, this second hour, uh, you know, Nick and Tim are going to be joining you on stage yeah. and we are going to be chatting about all the new things coming to Question Pro. You yeah. guys ready? Well, yeah, let's go ahead. Let's do it. Let's do it. Awesome. Hey, Nick. I think you're on mute there. Hey, Tim, how's it going? Good. Get some light on. Yeah, look at that. Nice. All right. Let me go ahead. I'm going to queue up the slides here. Give me a minute here. Let's see. Okay. 
There we go. All right. Okay, perfect. So we're going to be jumping into the product showcase now. So if you haven't got your coffee, go ahead and click that QR code. It's all over the place. Go get your coffee. It's not just for, you know, coffee is not just a morning drink, at least for me. I like it throughout the day. And they also have, you know, Starbucks has many different products and things. So you'll figure it out. But go ahead, click the QR code and get your coffee on us. Also want to mention, you know, kind of definitely in the comments, we're using that as like an interactive form. So as we're going through the product showcase, if you have questions, put it in there. If you have questions for Matt, if you watched that session and we didn't answer it, we'll answer those in the comments. Go ahead and put them in. If you're watching this later and you have questions, we'll be monitoring that for a while. So go ahead and then also use X Day 2020 on socials and we will follow along there and let's get some buzz going there. So today on the product showcase, I have myself, I have Nick Freiling talking about Insights Hub, Tim Cornelius talking about Instant Answers, which is our newest audience product, and we're excited to unveil that today. So that those will be the speakers. I'll be going first, followed by Tim, and then Nick will be bringing it up at the end here. So he'll be talking about Insights Hub at the end. So what I'll do here is this is the agenda. I wanted to talk about some of the giveaways that we're having, and then also talk about the roadmap. We'll take a look back at the first couple of quarters, take a look ahead, and then we'll dive into a product showcase here from Research Edition, Communities, Audience, and Insights. Uh, we'll be going through a lot of these features, both on the screen here, and then diving in to the product and giving a demo of some of those features as well. So as we mentioned a few minutes ago, we're giving away a ticket to the Quirks event in New York City on July 20th through the 21st. So if you want to join, the link is in the comments. We'll also put the QR code up throughout the day so you can feel free to go ahead and scan or enter on the link to in, uh, enter yourself for a free ticket to Quirks on us. So that's something that we're happy to give away. Kind of obviously fits with the Research Monday theme. So that is something that we are happy to give away. So definitely fill out the link with your information and we'll be selecting a winner probably later today or sometime this week at the latest. All right, this is an example of a the instant answers. Tim, this is kind of you know your your bread and butter here. So you want to talk a little bit about this? I know I'm putting you on the spot, but uh, this is an example of a type of question you can get with instant answers, census balance population. So this is a something that we have here. Um, I don't know, Tim, do you want to take this one or do you want to, want me to cover it? I got it. Um, so this is an instant answers question, which is our Slack integration. Um, it's the fastest way to get insights, whether you're trying to uh, ask a question. I think Nick asked whether a hot dog was a sandwich yesterday. Um, <laughs> but here's one. Um, do you believe we will see a multiverse on the upcoming Superman movie? Fair question. Uh, yeah. I love it. 14% um, say they don't watch superhero movies. And then a 59% say yes, there will be a uh, Spider-Man metaverse. Interesting. I, would, I think my avatar is going to be there. What about is yours? Yeah. yeah. I heard you're already there, Tim, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so if you have questions that you want us to ask, we'll be happy to do this throughout the day. So put in your questions in the comments. Give me a random question that you want asked to census balance population. Um, this is just to tease it up, but um, Tim will be talking about this in more detail later, giving a demo of the platform as well or the product. So this is an example of something, um, you know, it's a hot dog, a sandwich. Apparently it's the taco I heard, so I'm not really sure exactly what it is, but we can, you know, these are the questions that you can answer. You can also use other ones. We use this to get kind of sentiment around different news issues going on, anything that is a single question that you want to ask, ask to a census balanced population, you can go ahead and do that. So moving along, I want to talk a little about the, the research suite and the footprint here. So what is the research suite and what does that mean in terms of the product offering? So the research suite is really a collection of these five different products and services here. So it's the research edition uh, survey platform, which includes custom point and click logic, advanced question types, advanced analysis, kind of taking your research up a notch from our other licenses. It also includes our communities platform, which is 
a way that you can maintain and manage a hyper-engaged community of your brand's top promoters or even like-minded people and you want them in a community to do longitudinal ongoing research with them, you can co-create and collect both qualitative and quantitative insights. That's the community's platform. Audience, which Tim heads up, and we have access and the panels of 22 plus million respondents. And in that there's a self-service audience tool, which I'll be talking a little bit later about in my five things you probably didn't know about Question Pro, but should. So I'll be covering that. And then there's also uh, the instant answers integration that we have. And then this general, if you need online sample, Tim is the best in the business at finding it and matching your criteria. So we have that for you as well. We have Insights Hub, which is our consolidated platform to organize, explore, discover all of your research data and organize in one place. Nick will be talking about that, as I mentioned, coming up. And then more of a knowledge management tool. I think Question Pro is the only survey platform or Insights platform that has a product like this integrated in. So it's a key differentiator there for us. And then research services. So if you don't have time or you need help on any projects, we have a services team run by Patrick Jones here in the US that can help you out with that. So that's another um, offering that we have as part of the research suite. So well-rounded for all of your, your research needs. Moving on here, I wanna talk a bit about the research product roadmap, um, quickly what got released and what is in development, some things that we're working on um, coming up later this year. So what got released um, so far in, in Q1 and Q2, on the research side, we release grouping and cross tabs, which we'll be talking about later. An extraction and a new text highlighter question type um, also got released. On audience, some things like the ability to use unused credits, folder sharing, ability to soft launch. So that's obviously a key component of the self-service tool. In communities, we focused a lot on um, new endpoints for deletion verification, uh, alias for survey names, so you can name your survey something that means something to you, but it masks it from the respondent, so that way they don't see uh, perhaps you know potentially um, information that might give away new products. We worked on roles and permissions, uh, member profile logs, and um, expiration time for verification links. So a lot of things around security, you know, different roles, and um, also. Uh, video discussions and viewer mode, which we'll be talking about here. So what are some things that we're working on in Q3 and Q4, some things that are in development? So really focused a lot on sentiment and categorical analysis and enhancements in that space. Kind of goes on to some of the different analytics tools like cross tabs, reporting, matrix heat maps that we want to focus on and really round out the research with you know some good um, dashboarding capabilities as you know Matt mentioned earlier in his talk. It's really key, and we want to be at the forefront of that. Uh, another thing we're, we're focused on is continuing this edit survey collaboration, which I'll talk a little bit about today, and that's something that we're going to be releasing in the next couple months here, is the ability to, to edit surveys um, in collaboration with your team. Um, anonymity mode and community, so the ability to have your community, have your members, but you don't need to know who they are for whatever reasons, for legal or just for security reasons, GDPR and so forth. That's something that we're working on. A moderator uh, to member chat in community, so a way to chat directly uh, via chatbots, and then also um, instant answers, which you know we're going to be. Re it's released. We're also going to be working on it and doing some additional developments there. So those are some things we have coming up on the roadmap here. <clears throat> All right. So the product showcase. We'll dive into this now. Um, I'll be hosting it uh, along with you know Nick and Tim at their respected sec sections will uh, also be speaking. So diving into this, we'll talk about Research Edition, Communities, Insights Hub, Audience, and um, some products on each of these. So where are we going? So Research Edition, I wanna talk about answer grouping and cross tabs, edit survey collaboration, the survey preview 2.0, data quality, text highlighter, merge data 2.0 as well. And then also in communities, I'll be talking about the roles and permissions, the viewer mode and video discussions, which this kind of goes with what Matt was talking about earlier, where if there's an online or if there's an in-person focus group and you have the, the stakeholder come and they see what's going on behind the glass, they get really excited and they get, can get some buy-in there. So this is a similar mode, but for online. So we'll be talking more about that and then regional-based signups. So you can either allow or 
not allow people based on the region that they try to sign up on. So those are some things that'll be coming up in communities. Um, for instant answers, um, Tim will be going over more of this, but essentially it's ask your questions in Slack, get the results back in minutes from a representative population and share your findings. So it's a one-stop shop to get your questions answered and also report those results back to the world as well. So that's something that Tim will be covering uh, coming up here. And then Nick will be covering Insights Hub around democratize insights, optimize workflows, a deep, deeper dive into data. He'll be covering it along with a full demo. So it really is a nice piece that anchors on with the rest of the research suite here. So first I wanna talk about some research edition features and go in depth here, and then we'll give a live demo of some of these features as well. So answer grouping and cross tabs. So this is a feature that you allows you to, to group the answers in cross tabs here. Let me see if we can get a different view here. Maybe something like that, there we go. Um, answer grouping and cross tabs. So again, this is where you can group answers. Let's say the example here is you have um, what what kind of, what sort of following do you like? It's a list of fruits and vegetables. But then when it comes to analysis, you want to be able to break those down and, and to maybe categorize them into vegetables and fruits. So that's a simplistic example of what you can do here. But essentially, it allows you to take a long list and group them into categories that make sense. So we'll dive into this um, during the product demo coming up here. Um, edit survey collaboration. This is something that I am super excited about. It's something that if you're on a team, obviously you need to be able to edit with other team members and co-collaborate. It's table stakes these days, and I'm excited that Question Pro is at the forefront of technology for teams and using and teams using our platform will be able to utilize working in the same survey and editing, collaborating, and doing that. So you can see in the corner there, there's the circles that indicate who in who is in the survey from your team. You can see which question they're on. It'll highlight, it'll block it out so you can't edit it. So all those functionality and tools will be in place, but it really allows you to review and work and collaborate um, with other team members in the same workspace. So this is a, a feature that I wanted to tease here in the product showcase and at X day on Research Monday, but we'll be getting more into this um, as we continue to develop it, it'll be released in the next couple of months. But I wanted to mention it here because I do think it is an, an important feature and you can see the things that we're thinking about here at Question Pro. Um, Survey Preview 2.0. I'll be giving a demo of this, a live demo. This really allows you to, when you want to review the survey and do a final check and you want to preview it, see how this looks for the respondents, but yet you still have your logic, you have your validation, you have your page breaks, and it can be a pain to have to try to remember the different flows if you just want to check and see how things look in the survey preview. So this gives you the ability to enable or disable all of the different page breaks and the logic options so you can easily get through the survey to see how it looks on desktop, on mobile, on an iPad, all the different um, forms, form factors that you'd want to check out. And also you can jump to specific blocks. You can type in specific custom variables. Let's say you want to see how your survey, uh, how the survey flow goes for something that is uh, one of the custom variables and you want to see that the show high logic is working and you want to jump to that. This gives you the ability to do that. So the survey preview 2.0 is something that, that's cutting edge and at the forefront of, uh, of what we're going to be releasing here um, very shortly on Question Pro. And I'll give you a demo of this as well uh, coming up. Um, data quality. So data quality is something that we are taking very seriously at Question Pro because your results are only as good as the valid data that you have collected. If you have data coming in that has gibberish words, duplicate text across responses, the data is not good. It's the essentially it's useless data set to you. So we want to make sure that we're helping you and getting the, the best quality data in your hands. And this is the suite of tools that we are we have developed and continuing to develop is with around data quality. It's one of the most important things I think in the industry today. And we have many tools available to help with this. I'll give you a preview, but we're working on things like if two of these, let's say you have three of these data quality um, checks enabled and a respondent 
fails two of them, they automatically disqualify it. So working on things like that, in addition to just having the tools, so making it usable um, for you and then also to make sense to get the data collected that you need. And then text highlighter. So this is a new question type that we've released and it really allows you to get feedback on ad copy or any text copy. You can see what people like, what they dislike. So you can go back and you can edit that as well. So this is a another tool that I will be showcasing here um, coming up very shortly. And then what I wanna do here is go to the next feature set, which is Merge Data 2.0. And this is where, let's say you have two surveys with similar data, there's some maybe some common questions and you wanna merge that data so you can easily do the analysis on that combined data set. This is something that we have in Question Pro, a Merge Data 2.0 where you can combine the survey from multiple data set, multiple data sets into one to do your analysis. So it makes reporting easier. You don't have to try to like import that data or upload it. It's we automatically merge it for you and make that process really simple and easy. And I would say, you know, this might be a good reminder to get your questions in. If you have questions about any of these, we'll be doing a, a Q&A feature at or Q&A um, at the end of this and we'll definitely answer any questions that come up. Okay, so now I want to jump into a demo of some of those different products that we mentioned. So give me a second here to share my screen. And I will do this, okay. Perfect, all right, let's see. All right, perfect, okay. And so what I wanted to show first was the answer grouping. So I have a survey here inside of Question Pro. And what I want to know, right? Uh, so I'll come here, hit answer grouping. And this is a survey that I have a similar, you know, uh, which of the following is your favorite fruit or vegetable? And they select it. And then some questions here. So if I go to analytics and then go to analysis and I go to cross tabulation. I've done it here and I'll show you how I did it and then we'll jump into an example. So while this cross tab is loading here, you can see that I have the fruits or vegetables and then I have what is your gender. What I can do here is I'll jump out of this and then I will also show you an example of the new cross tabulation. So I can label this, I'll just name it X day and I'll save this. And then what I can do is over here, you can see all of the different questions, you know, which of the following is your favorite fruit or vegetable. You can also drill down, you can set the different columns and so forth. So if I update this, changes are saved. But now this apple, orange, banana, blueberries, you know, this doesn't help me. I wanna combine these into, into different categories. So what I can do here is I can drag this over into this first category. So I have orange, uh, or apple, a banana, and I wanna put the blueberries in here. And I wanna name this, this will be my fruits. And then I wanna create a new category. So I will go to spinach oops, over here, cross that out. All right, and then broccoli and asparagus. Okay, and then I wanna name this, name it veggies. So I'll save this and then you can see it's performing the action here. And then what will happen is it will show up in the, in the cross tab here. So let me see, all right, go to X day here. And you can see here that um, which of the following is your favorite fruit or vegetable. It combined these into fruits and veggies. So it categorized those responses, aggregated the data for each one. So now you can easily analyze fruits and vegetables. Okay, the next one I wanted to show you was a survey preview. So this is an example of a survey here. Um, this, this I'll turn on all of these different things. So this is a classic example of what it would look like for a survey, a traditional survey preview. But here what we've done is allowed you to be able to remove validation so you can easily skip through. If I have this, I must select an answer. But if I want to remove validation so I can easily go through the survey, I can do that. Um, can also turn that back on. Now, logic. Logic is obviously something you need in, in surveys. 
but it can be a pain to get to where you want to test in the survey and to see what it looks like. So what you can do is you can disable logic and that'll allow you to easily go through and, and check your survey. Another thing is page breaks. Um, page breaks are can be kind of a pain. So if you turn that off or on, then you'll be able to see all of the different uh, questions on one page if you just wanted to check that out. So those are some quick things. You can also jump to different blocks here. And then if you have URLs or if you have custom variables that you want to carry in the URL, you can come in here and you know, select custom three, input that value in, and then it will take you through that path in the survey. So that is the, the new survey preview that we'll, we'll be releasing, which is a great advantage for all of our Question Pro users to be able to test and preview their surveys uh, more efficiently. Another thing that we are doing is that I wanted to show is the data quality. So I will jump to a different survey here and let's see product or service review. And then here we have, um, if you go into analytics and then you go to manage data, you can see data quality. Now data quality here is you can do duplicate IP addresses, gibberish words, duplicate text, one word answers and so forth. You can see the options there. All, most of these have where you can flag the response if you wanna flag it to review it later. Some, um, you can also flag and terminate responses. So for instance, for gibberish words, I did the flag and terminate response here. So what this looks like from a practical perspective is I, it'll automatically do a data quality terminate here. So if I come in here and I say, yes, I've used this, um, I would rate this good and I will just put in, you know, some gibberish text here. I go to next and you can see it kicks me out because I entered the gibberish text there. The system detected that. So I'm not allowed to continue in the survey, which is great because as I mentioned earlier, you know, you only want to have, you know, the best data in your survey. And this will help ensure that by using some of these, some of these data quality methods that we have inside of Question Pro. Another thing that I wanted to show you is the, the text highlighter. And I will jump to another survey here and to show you that. So text highlighter. So here's an example of it. Um, you can see that we have 20 responses here. This is just some text about Question Pro. People can like or dislike it. I'll show you the preview of what this looks like. So from a respondent point of view, let's say I wanna highlight this. I can choose to like it and then you know really like the wording here and you can save this so you can be able to view those comments but maybe you know this one maybe this isn't great you just like it and needs to be rewritten something you know and then you can save that and then hit done so what this looks like and the results that we get back are you can go into analytics here and then what you can do is go to text analysis and then go to text highlighter, click on this, and it'll give you all of the th different things that people like. And you can also click on things that they dislike. And the darker the red, you can see are areas that both people have liked and disliked. So you can see the different, um, the contrast of colors there. So you can definitely see those that liked and disliked. So, and it'll give you a sum here if people liked it. Um, you can also export this as well. So this is the text highlighter question type that we've added to our question suite here. And with that, I want to switch back over and I want to go over, now we'll cover some of the, the communities features here. So switching back to the communities product showcase, I want to talk about roles and permissions. So this is where you can create customized roles for team members, allowing access um, only to specific modules. Now, this is great for organizations or even for research firms that have a client they're managing a community for. Maybe they only need access to, to certain areas of the community's platform. Or let's say you're doing some video discussions and you have um, the moderator and they only need access to that module of the discussions. These are all things you can do now with the roles and permissions, which I will show you um, coming up here as well. Viewer mode and discussions. So, we released video discussions in 2021, kind of at the end of 2020, going into 2021. It worked. We really needed a way to have the ability to allow our clients to create a viewer mode where they can invite people, they go to a link and they view a live stream essentially 
of the group. The members that are taking taking part in the group don't know that anyone else is watching. Much like a traditional focus group where you have the two-way mirror, this viewer mode mimics that. They can chat with the moderator as well, which, which I'll show you here um, in an example coming up. But this viewer mode in, in, in video discussions really allows for additional stakeholder buy-in and sharing the link, and I think is really a game changer when it comes to our video discussion suite. The next is regional-based signups. So this is something that um, you can use to control who gets into your community or more importantly, who you're gonna exclude. So you can do that. So if you have a community in the US and you wanna exclude everybody from the rest of the world, you can easily do that here just by selecting the US option. So I'll show you an example of this as well. And with that, let me demo these things. And then next up we have Tim who will be unveiling Instant Answers, which is our newest audience product. So let me jump back in and I'll add this to the stream and then I'll get back into Question Pro here. So first I wanted to show you the roles and permissions in Question Pro. So for communities. So if I go to organization, I can see roles here and I want to set up a new role. So how I can do that is when I come here, you'll see some options that will come up and I can select between the different modules. So here are some users. I can go ahead and I can add a role here and this pop-up will give me some different options. Um, and I can select come in here and I can go to communities. And then here are all of my global settings for a community. Here's more of my community management, like my settings, content, languages, profile. I can you know, distribute to the community. Um, these are different options and different sections of the community that I can access. Same with the incentive module. You don't need everybody touching that. So it's good to have the ability to choose the permissions. And the modules here, so a typical example that I see is I only want to allow access to the discussions module so the moderator can come in and manage the discussion. That is something here that you can see just by clicking this and maybe you name this role as a uh, you know, video discussion a moderator. And then you can save this, create the role, and then you can see that that role has been created here. So that is roles and permissions in communities, allowing for greater uh, greater control uh, when you have big teams or even want to invite someone into the community platform. Okay, next I wanted to show you the viewer mode. So um, this is in video discussions, which is one of the newest uh, features that we have inside of the community's product. So here, if I go to discussions, I started this X day test, so I can click on this. And what I can do here is I can start the meeting. So you can see that this pops up, um, joining the meeting here. This is what it's like from a moderator point of view. I can see I have all the controls here. And then let's say I invited some people that were my stakeholders that I wanted to come into the discussion as well. So I can come in here and I'll have this link pop up. I can enter a name and then all of these people can come in here, If come and I invite members. I can enter in their email addresses. They get an invite that has the link to join as a viewer along with a code that protects it. So I can come in here, I can enter my name. I'm gonna be Dan Stakeholder. And then I enter my access code and I join. So from here, you can see this is the, the viewer mode. This is the name of the of the discussion going on. You can see the back room. You can see the group info. Who are the moderators? If there were people joining, you could get a list of the attendees as well. And this back room communicates with the moderator. So I could say, I would like you to um, pinpoint the thought about you know products or whatever product X. And then you can send this. And then to me as a, a stakeholder or as a moderator, then I can come in here and I can see, you know, this comment. So I would know, okay, um, this stakeholder wants me to dive in a little bit more to this question. That's something that I'm going to do. 
And then likewise, I can see other comments and I can see group, group info as well from a moderator perspective. So that is the viewer mode and discussions. If you want to give this a try, definitely let me know. Happy to help set up a discussion for you and have my team um, get involved and, and do that as well. So then the final thing I wanted to show you before we dive in and go over the new Instant Answers product, and Tim will be coming on to do that, is quickly I wanted to show you the regional-based signups for communities. So here, if you come in under the settings and you scroll down to security, you can see the regional signups here. So you can this will restrict or allow anyone that you have coming into this. So if you wanted only people from the United States, you can select that and then boom, you're ready to go. And it'll allow um, people only from the United States. So it's really a way that you can help lock down on the regional or the region that you want inside of your community. So hoping this helps out with not only fraud, but people trying to game the system and so forth and just allow for um, greater security and control inside of your community. So those are the, the research and communities uh, products that I wanted to go over and demo. Hope you're excited about it. If you have questions, definitely hit me up either on this research Monday or after the fact. Always happy to answer questions and engage with anybody who wants to know more about Question Pro. So with that, I will pass it over to Tim. Tim, are you there? Oh, sorry. I kept getting you off and on there. So I'll go <laughs> away, Tim, and you take it from here, okay? Awesome. Sounds good. Um, let me... See here. So let's talk about Instant Answers, the product showcase. Um, I would like to do a demo. Uh, we spoke earlier about Instant Answers, how it's a Slack uh, bot uh, integration, uh, AI, whatever you want to call it. Um, it's great. Let me go to share it real quick. All right. I have to share my screen. All right, so we are in the Instant Answers X Day form. So first thing that you do, get my computer here, is you're gonna do backslash question pro INS. Enter. Now let's talk to the robot. That's not how you spell sandwich. And you're going to put your question, you're going to put your answer choices. We should put yes and yes. No, just kidding. Um, you can click to see how many people that you want to. Uh, invite to the survey to answer. You can also click to see the language and location that you would like to invite people to take it. Um, so for this one, you know, we're going to answer Nick's question that is burning. Um, and let's just do 10 for this time. So what we're going to do is submit it to English United States. Now, because it's in Slack, it does not mean that it is being answered by the people in Slack. It's going out to any and everyone. Um, so let's do it. We've submitted the question and what it did in the back end is it made a survey for us saying, is a hot dog a sandwich? Uh, 10 people around the US are gonna answer that and we're gonna find out whether that's a sandwich or not. So yes or no. Um, And then, all right, so stop sharing my screen. Can we bring the slides back up? Next one.
Do you have access to them, Tom? No, I, I don't. All right, so what I just did, um, here we go. You type a question using the Slack shortcut that I just did. Um, next slide. You select the bot. Next one. Nice. So this is going over what you showed, right, Tim? Yes, this is going okay. exactly what I showed. So the dialogue mm -hmm. appears. You get to talk to uh, the future and the metaverse. Um, okay. you, put the, <laughs> you put the question in there first. It's mandatory. Um, you type in your answer choices. You select the number of people that you would like to speak to. And you ask them in what language and location. Tim, what do you think a good number is here? Like, is it, should they always do 50, 150, 300? What? What's sort of the ballpark or some best practices here? Sure. So if it's, um, it depends on your subject matter. I would say uh, 150 is good. If you just want to get a quick answer for some content, we have some customers that are just doing 10 or 50 for the sake of speed. Right. Um, and that's, that's how we're, uh, that's what I would suggest. Awesome. Next slide. So this is what it made. Uh, it's sent out to a highly curated audience. Uh, you get updates as soon as the respondents come in. And then your results are visualized. So you Perfect. get to see a pie chart. It's pretty awesome. And then you can easily share those, right? With Not only with team members, but on socials or in reports and things. That's, that's perfect. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so... Should be getting uh, some answers really quick. Nice. Um, uh, so the, here's the different charts. Um, if there's five more than five options, the chart changes to a horizontal view mm -hmm. uh, and highlights the the top answer. So you don't have to dig or or look through it too much. Perfect. That's awesome. And I know you showed it earlier, but did you want to show it? Again here, or do we have some re results in, or? Um, let me see here. So, Tim, why, while they're kind of waiting for results or the next steps, what who is like the ideal user of Instant Answers? Is it a researcher? Is it someone creating content? Is it someone in the marketing department? What do you think is the ideal buyer for this? So I would say uh, anyone who is asking quick questions um, that need to be answered, mm -hmm. uh, but that's that's kind of a cop out. So I would say um, <laughs> marketing is great. We have customers that use it to highlight um, highlight uh, content, as in uh, fifty seven percent of you know. Uh, Gen Zers or Xers or baby boomers have took up yoga in the last year. Um, mm -hmm. That would be just a, a key point that they would uh, put in an email subject line or put right. it on LinkedIn and drive content to their site. Got it. That makes sense. And I know when we had an early release of this and we had some beta customers using it, there were, I would say, large companies and that were producing products that they had a list of names and each one would work, but they just needed like, hey, let's just pick one. So they used this Slack integration to really just, hey, pick a name. And they ended up going with that name for whatever snack that they were producing. So I know that's another use case for it is when you're trying to decide between, you know, quickly between some different names, put it into the Slack integration and boom, you have your answer in minutes. So less kind of wishy-washy thinking and just more, with, hey, this is what consumers want. So it's super easy. And we've, I like, we use it all the time internally. I know Crystal Weese, you saw earlier on, is, you know, she's a big advocate of it. And we just, we have fun with it, but also use it for some of our content. And I know our clients do the same thing. So, sure. Really easy to do. Yeah. Definitely want to show you guys uh, real quick what it looks like when you get your first answer. So, here we've got 20% of the answers in. This progress oh, bar is going to continue to um, continue to grow as more people answer it. So perfect, nice. 
So you always you won't be left in the dark. You know exactly how long it'll take to get your research results in, where things are at, and yeah. we'll soon know if a hot dog is a sandwich or not. So that's exciting. Yeah, and that's one of the things that this product is meant to fix. Um, it's you know the the two biggest issues I run into with interviews is with um, serious researchers is. Um, the time it takes to Mm -hmm. get your results and your analysis and, you know, just being in the dark, it feels like you put everything into a black box sometimes when you're in marketplaces and this is really showing you like, Hey, this is first party data. You are directly talking to a human being right here, Mm -hmm. um, and bringing back the results. So you're able to, um, deliver on your customer. So if someone say, if uh, your boss comes to you and asks you, Hey, let's ask this question. You can say, all right, we're 30% there. And you don't worry about it. Um, You don't have to learn a a whole new, uh, a whole new system. Um, The masterclass that you just did on the (laughs) platform, you don't need any of that. You just need to know how to ask questions. Yeah. Okay. I think that's easy, right? And it's already in, if you're using Slack already, you're in it. You can get your question fielded faster than you can, you know, go and create a survey and so forth. So I think, I think that's great. Also, I've, I've used this going into some meetings where I just either, let's say you're meeting someone for the first time and you want something interesting to talk about. You can type in like and get some quick results or you're going into a meeting and you're a sales guy and you need something around these results just to, to be able to tell people inside and say, Hey, you wanted these, I got the answers right here. So I think quick results integrated in with um, tools you're already using is, are some key benefits here, um, which I really like. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. I was going to jump in and say a lot of it back to the keynote. A lot of times researchers just have to really start a conversation with marketing or with sales to kind of prove or validate, you know, the, the value of the research. And I think this is a quick way to do that because Having done a lot of these, there's there's a lot of things you learn that you never would have guessed. And a lot of it depends yeah, on how true. you ask the question. So I yeah. think it's a great way to start a conversation, just kind of pulling us back to what Matt was talking about um, and kind of proving the value of research to uh, to marketers, really to whoever. Yeah. yeah, I think that's a good point. And to not make it overly complicated, right? Make it easy for them so mm-hmm. they can get the, get the research results that they need. Sorry, Tim, I think you're going to say something. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, that, that's one of the things that one of the best use cases that I've seen for it is, you know, sometimes you don't know how to ask the question. And I, I'm going to speak a little bit later about um, accessibility and the, the types of questions to ask. And, you know, this is a perfect environment for you to set up your question to figure out, hey, am I, am I, is this uh, question legible or, or, or mm-hmm. things like that? So um, let me, let me just show you the final results. Yeah, let's see it. I want to know. Who's got the drum roll? Anybody? Bing! 70% says yes. Let's see that question pro watermark. I love it. Awesome. So yes, it is a sandwich. Yeah. All right. Is that what you thought, Nick? No, it's not. I wonder if we asked if it was a taco, if maybe it'll be the same result. And, and we, <laughs> no. then we don't know what it is. <laughs> Interesting. So, awesome. So with that, um, Nick, we'll let you take it away here. I'll queue up these slides for you and then I will go away and you can take it from here. Awesome. Thank you. Um, yeah. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever it is, wherever you are. Um, I'm super excited to be here. Uh, my name is Nick. I am the director of Insights Hub here at Question Pro um, coming to you today from sunny Jacksonville, Florida. Not too sunny today, actually, but usually pretty sunny. Um, If you've been following Question Pro closely over the past uh, 12 months, which I know that a lot of our users, a lot of our customers do, um, you probably know a little about Insights Hub already. I know that um, our CEO has kind of teased the platform for a little while. Um, I'm here today to to say or to announce that over the past three months, we've uh, it's it's really kind of taken off. We've seen a lot of interest from. existing customers and also teams that are brand new to kind of the question pro suite um, that are looking for a solution um, like this. So this is a, it's, it's a platform that we're all super excited about. Um, you may have seen some buzz over the past, I think probably about a year and especially this year around what's kind of called 
insights repositories um, or uh, kind of knowledge management apps or platforms. Um, it's a pretty hot space. Uh, like I said, this year especially, I've seen kind of a lot of new, a new, a lot of new faces, a lot of new names. Um, insights Hub is Question Pros kind of offer in this space, but it's a lot more than just kind of a wiki or a knowledge management app. Um, Insights Hub comes built in with some key differentiators um, against other similar apps. Um, and it all kind of boils down to this, that Insights Hub is built for insights. Um, as you probably know, if you're at all familiar with Question Pro, um, Question Pro team, Question Pro people really know their stuff um, when it comes to insights. Uh, this is the team behind Insights Hub. This is an insights repository built for uh, insights teams, for high-performing insights teams, for high-achieving insights teams. If you're not an insights team, this is probably not the tool for you. If you're an insights team, but you're not serious about maximizing the value of your data, of your of your insights research, it's probably not the tool for you either. Um, I'm not going to shy away from saying that. Um, and then Insights Hub, it's, it's a specialized tool um, for insights teams that are ready to take their knowledge management and insight sharing capabilities really up to the next level. Um, like I said, it's built for insights. It empowers insights teams to get organized, be more agile, and generate better research. Um, now, how exactly does this work? Um, I will direct your attention to the slides. We have three key themes when it comes to how we think about Insights Hub um, and how it levels up insights teams. Um, now, the first of these is what we call democratized insights. Now, this is kind of a phrase that you've probably heard a bit about um, from Question Pro over the past few years, uh, well, a few months to, few, to past year. Um, insights Hub has the tools you need to share and apply insights across your organization. It's a dedicated and searchable repository of insights data, uh, research methods, and everything that your insights team is doing. By everything, I mean everything your insights team is doing. Um, no more flipping between apps to look at different uh, projects or reports or studies. No more chasing down people at your organization uh, to find out what was learned from this study or that study, or even if like whether that study was even done that you talked about a few months ago. Um, no more scouring messy shared drives that don't allow you to search inside the content of files. Of course, you can search by file names. Uh, you can't necessarily search inside uh, the content of those files. And that's really, of course, what matters. Insights Hub solves this problem. It makes your insights data accessible to anyone. Um, I'll show you how this works in a minute. Second key theme that we think about when we think about Insights Hub um, are what I'm calling optimized workflows. So as a, a, any researcher uh, or research lead uh, knows, uh, the number of apps, tools, platforms that your team is using over the past few years has probably ballooned. There are a ton of great tools out there, a ton of new tools out there. They're not always under one roof or ecosystem. Yes, some of them don't exist in the Question Pro suite, um, but there are a lot of great tools. We know that, everybody knows that, that makes workflows pretty clunky. Um, I've seen too many teams, agencies, research teams, um, they spend a lot of time you know, mapping data or projects or apps back and forth across projects. Maybe they have a particular nomenclature they use to make sure that you know, the survey is named the same thing as the uh, you know, report file is named the same thing as the Excel file is named the same thing in the you know, consumer interview app you might be using. Um, it gets clunky. Um, insights teams tend to rely too much, I think, um, on researchers simply remembering what tools were used in a particular study, uh, remembering whose login was used. I used to work at an agency and I'd have to ask my various you know, supervisors, hey, was this under your login or your login? You know, Where was this study conducted? Um, this gets messy, it wastes time, it's not efficient. Insights Hub solves this problem by allowing researchers to kick off projects without leaving Insights Hub. And I'll show you how that works in the, in the demo in a minute. Um, but basically you would define a project inside of Insights Hub. This is kind of at a higher level. Um, and then create or link a survey or any app or tool that you're using in pursuit of that research uh, to that project. When research is complete, um, researchers store key findings and nuggets inside of that project. Um, it's not a separate file. It's not a separate application. All of those findings are stored alongside the tools, uh, the applications used to conduct that research. Um, so this makes those valuable, valuable insights easy to find later on and easy for anybody to find uh, later on. So finally, our last kind of key theme for Insights Hub is uh, what I just, I you'll call dive deeper into data. It's really the best way I can kind of explain exactly what this does. Um, features like smart tagging, deep search, um, knowledge graphing, make it possible to uncover insights that a lot of teams never knew that they had. Um, they connect projects together across teams 
across research programs and initiatives to discover what I call meta themes or cross project trends, um, things that you, you may learn over the course of four or five different studies on a particular topic or on a particular audience um, that you never would have noticed had you not kind of been adding these findings to knowledge graphs inside of Insights Hub over time. And I'll show you a really good example of one of those kind of higher level or meta findings uh, in a minute. Um, but remember, Insights Hub users have full transparency into project files and timelines all in one place. Um, it makes it easy for researchers and anybody, including marketing teams, as we heard in the keynote, um, to search and scan project details, um, assign key themes and nuggets, uh, maybe even question or, or ask questions about why a particular study was done this way, You know what this particular, particular tool did, hopefully sparking other ideas from other departments or other stakeholders uh, to engage the research team or the insights team on a little bit of a deeper level. Um, so let me share my screen here and give you just a quick kind of four or five minute demo of what uh, this uh, platform looks like. You should be seeing the Insights Hub homepage on this screen. It looks like, yes, you are. Um, this is kind of, this is what the homepage looks like. The search bar, it's kind of prominent. It's very powerful. It's kind of one of the key, uh, you know, key functions or, or features here in inside of Insights Hub that allows you to deep search across the projects that you've done, across the insights you've written, across narrative data or commentary. Um, and then over here on the right side is a weekly summary. It just shows a quick snapshot of your insights team's production um, week over week. Um, so you can see this is this is my personal install. So it shows I've made one new project this week. It's only Monday, so you'll have to give me uh, some slack. But one new project this week, uh, five knowledge graph links, one active researcher in the platform this week. So whether you're a researcher or especially if you're a research team lead, this is a powerful way to make sure that your insights production, um, you know, is is pacing well. That it's not the you know that there's not a drop off, or that if there is, at least you're notified and you know that. Um, there's also a little bit more of a detailed dashboard here, which shows your research production or insights production um, month over month. Um, so this shows you, uh, you know, queued active completed researchers uh, or completed projects uh, across uh, across the past. It looks like we're showing four months um, at this point. A lot of this can be customized to fit your team's workflows. Um, and what I wanted to do is, is show you kind of the process of setting up a project inside of Insights Hub. So the way that is done here is um, inside of the right homepage, uh, new project. Um, I think that's pretty intuitive. It's how you set up a new project. Um, you pick from this, this screen from a list of project types that you've set up. Um, so this can be, I've created kind of some standard research projects here, concept test, add recall, um, usability, but these can be whatever you'd like. Some teams kind of use team lead uh, names or team names in order to kind of classify or categorize their projects. Uh, I'm gonna, just going to select your concept test. Um, and then this jumps you to a project setup screen. It's very basic, very simple. Um, there's not a lot to it. Rather than do this though, I'm just gonna jump into a project that I set up earlier today um, for this, uh, for the purposes of this demo. Um, this is what the, kind of the homepage of a project inside of Insights Hub looks like. Now, this is the details page where you would list kind of an intro about the project to make it easy to search and find uh, this for any anyone on your team later on. Under the details tab is where you would probably leave like scoping notes. Maybe if you met with marketing or you met with your your client, uh, you know about this project. This is what they're looking for. This gives you some context. Um, the research objectives can be listed in here. Um, from there, I'll jump to the operations tab, which is a quick way to link surveys inside of Question Pro and from other apps and tools to this project, so that it's not so much a concern whether you've named the project in the Question Pro surveys, you know, the exact nomenclature that you need to name it in order to be able to find it, search it, map it later on. This is a way you would link a survey project um, from Question Pro. So you click link, um, your list of Question Pro surveys will come up. I'll select gender segmentation study. Um, that survey will then show up here as, as a linked project to this overall research, uh, the overall research project. So you may have multiple surveys kind of feeding into this research project or this research goal. Um, and it may not just be a survey, like I said, you can link other tools as well to this platform so that any researcher knows what tools were used in pursuit of, uh, you know, in pursuit of this research goal. Um, lastly here, I want to show you what's called a notepad. So this is where you would store narrative insights or narrative uh, data, pro probably qualitative data, perhaps interview notes, something like that, um, to this project. So I'm going to go ahead and set up a new notepad, um, click video, uh, video audio notepad. Uh, 
basically you select for whatever one of these you like. Blank is, of course, if it's just kind of a notepad of your notes, your thoughts, your findings, observations. Live interview is to conduct an interview in person. There's some tools that make that very easy. And then a video audio uh, interview to upload a certain video or audio file, maybe a consumer interview, something like that. Um, I'm going to show you real quickly in notepad what it looks like. Uh, this is where you would upload a video. Uh, you would show that video. You could watch that video here um, in, uh, in real time. Um, or you know, you could watch it, and as as you're watching it, you can take notes. If you said consumer says, you know, product is too cheap, uh, or whatever whatever the finding is, you highlight that here. Uh, you can add that as a key finding to this project. Um, you can add that to what's called a knowledge graph, uh, which links this this key finding to other key findings from other projects across Insights Hub. Um, so. Let me show you one last thing here. Knowledge graphs is, like I said, is where you would link projects together uh, across themes. So this is a knowledge graph I've set up. Uh, kind of the key theme here is willingness to pay. Um, this project, uh, or this, there are kind of two subheaders underneath this that I've set up. You can set these up however you'd like. In this case, let's click on too expensive. Actually, it's already pulled up. Uh, these are all of the studies, key findings, mentions of this idea across all of your research projects. So it shows you not just what one study said about whether this project is too expensive. Um, it showed you. It, it shows you uh, what every project you've ever done where this came up and where your researchers were diligent about adding this to the knowledge graph shows up. So in this case, you know this idea, this phrase, uh, too expensive has come up. Uh, and it's commonly paired here with millennials. So this is what I said about kind of meta insights or meta research. It shows you uh, opportunities for follow-up studies and follow-up research. You know, why is this concept coming up frequently uh, with millennials? You know, is there some kind of problem where they perceive your product to be too expensive, um, et cetera, et cetera. So that's kind of a quick demo. I'm happy to show this to anybody at any time. I love demoing Insights Hub. There's a lot of different ways to use it. It's very customizable. Um, kind of the way you'd set this up is really up to you your taxonomy, your project types, project themes, programs. It's really up to you. Um, so I'd love to show you any time. Um, I think with that, I'll spin it back to, uh, is it back to Dan? Uh, but again, if you have any questions, please let me know. Ask in the uh, comments. We'll be happy to answer. Yeah, Nick, I know I had one question coming up. So what are some things that you're working on now that you're most excited about that are going to be adding to the product? Yeah, so we're kind of, so I showed you this kind of knowledge graph uh, interface here. Um, yeah. We're working to make this a little bit more visual so that, you know, where themes are really prominent, um, you know, the, the word or kind of the container is bigger to kind of make those connections for you quickly. But a lot of that data is already here. And that's right. really, you know, what kind of the, the bottom line researchers are looking at. Um, and then if we're some more enhancements here too, also to notepads, um, bringing in other apps uh, to integrate with this so that you can create notepads from, you know, other type of qualitative or consumer interview applications that you're using. Interesting. So it's not just for question pro, it's really for research teams to pull in other tools that they're using and have one repository for all of their data then, right? Exactly. Yeah, there are some deep integrations with Question Pro specifically, mm -hmm. um, but any we're, we're working basically upon request. We are integrating other apps with Insights Hub to make it easy and to make it truly kind of the system of record or the one-stop shop for all of your Insights team's work. Awesome, awesome. No, I think it's really a differentiator that I see in when Question Pro because no other survey or Insights platform has the data repository or knowledge management platform included in it and mm -hmm. we have it it's integrated in as nick was sharing and obviously we've kept that top of mind when developing it so it's a key differentiator for those looking for not only a survey platform but to manage your your insights across your whole org as well and if you're using question pro we can easily add on insights hub it's all integrated in so it's not another another website mm -hmm. or anything it's it's just a drop down inside of question pro away so, exactly yeah. Yeah. The last thing we want is to make another app more work. This this does yeah. that work for you is kind of the idea. Awesome. Awesome. So I think with that, um, thanks, Nick. I really appreciate you coming on and showing insights up. If you have questions after this, Nick is can be found anywhere, but you know, nick.frowling at questionpro.com. Um, he'll be happy to answer any questions about insights up. And I know he loves demoing it. I think he's told me that. And um, he'll be happy to show you if you have any questions. So uh, with that, thanks, Nick. Really appreciate you coming on. Thank you. Awesome.
Look at that, Crystal. We, <laughs> we, you know, I will say that this day is going smooth in terms of time. We are ending on time and starting on time. <laughs> 12 o'clock on the dot. I felt so yeah. bad for Nick. I thought you ran over a little, Dan. <laughs> no, it was my fault. I, you know, sometimes in your head, you're like, I can get through all this stuff. And then you start kind of get into it and like, no, nah, I got to speed things I know, up. There were even questions that I didn't put in there for you. I was like, oh, mm. there were a couple of questions. So I'm going to pop them up now just okay. because we did promise people we were going to answer questions. I yeah. don't want anyone to feel like we're not listening to them. Okay. And uh, let me see. Uh, there was one about integration. Oh, my gosh. We got to get through all the comments. Um, somebody asked if there are any new integrations on the horizon. I know we do have a couple on the horizon mm -hmm. with copper and yep. a few others like that. I know that we have some of those integrations coming up. Um, we also have, you know, Zapier as well. So you can, with that, you can pretty much integrate with anything. So um, if there's something specific you're looking for, let me know, but we are planning on expanding our, our integrations as well. The same person also really liked the cross tabs update. Nice. I like that. See? Yeah. And cool. like that. we got a shout out for data quality. Awesome. I love data um, quality. I think it's super important. Two of those actually. Yeah. Love the data quality features. And nice. then we also, you know, Dr. Karen, she also said that she really has been enjoying the diverse language of the platform. So I think you guys are doing all hey. the right things. You know, that's great. I love hearing these comments and more importantly that we're able to help these folks out too and provide them the tools they need to get the research done. So yeah. So before we jump into the next section, next session, I just want to remind everyone of all the different things we have going on. We don't forget to, ooh, let me find all the buttons. Don't forget to get a free Starbucks on us this afternoon. Yeah, we are hitting noon. Right now, <laughs> Dan, are you going to like scan it right now and get yeah. yours? Yeah, I'm, <laughs> you going and Sarah. I'm going right after um, this. <laughs> I know. I actually ordered two and I have one in the fridge for later. Smart, I'm smart. a thinker. <laughs> um, make sure you get your free Starbucks on us. And we will be giving away a Quarks ticket. You can join Dan and someone else on his team in New York. He hasn't decided who yet. <laughs> Vote for Crystal. <laughs> um, and you can join us at Quirks in NYC as um, in July. Yeah. And we are always happy to hear from you and see you all over the world. So please let us know if you ever drop into Austin. We'd be happy to show you all the sites. So what do we have going on next, Dan? Next, Tim is going to be coming on and talking about inclusion in surveys. I love that. And so with that, uh, I'll chat with you after Tim's conversation, and then we'll awesome. get into the top five things that we don't know about question. Prep. Perfect. Looking forward to it. See you in a little bit. All right. <laughs>I would say the title of this one is your online research is disqualifying. Um, my name is Timothy Cornelius. Um, I'm director of audience operations at Question Pro. You just heard from me um, about instant answers if you were lucky enough to be here. Um, the agenda for this talk uh, for the next 20, 30 minutes or so is uh, life conditions I've been blind to. Um, mistakes I've made in sampling and how you can avoid them and solutions that I've personally implemented. So I started out at Gartner where I learned of research companies uh, in various areas of space. Um, I then was, uh, I, f I found a little startup named Lucid um, and they were hiring in my hometown of New Orleans. So I went there uh, and learned about the best and the worst as it pertains to sampling. Um, and you could see who was doing it right and who was doing it wrong. Um, and then I moved over to Question Pro and I saw a whole new uh, side of the business where you could see where the respondent is hitting a roadblock um, or having any issues. So 
that's what made me start P3. And I'll get into that in, here in a second. So there was a quote at Lucid um, in our big auditorium. Uh, I think they maybe they call it the aquarium. Um, the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. So let's open up our minds for a second here. So let's meet Ariel. She's 36 years old. She's a female. California resident, she hit all of my standard qualifications, but she was born deaf. Um, I had a survey where I had a, uh, we were ad testing um, a, a pilot um, and Ariel uh, listened or, or watched the video and was out answering a red herring question on the video, but that video did not have closed captions by default. Uh, there was no back button. There was no way that she could answer the survey at all. Um, so I chatted with her uh, like the whole night. I was asking her, what has, how have, what is your survey experience like? What, uh, what does it feel like being you in your shoes, in your world? Well, uh, it did not feel good. Um, I got a talking to um, over chat. Uh, she was 15 minutes late to pick up her kids from school. Um, I wasted 15 minutes of her time. Um, it, it just, it was an awful, uh, awful experience for her. And I set out to change that and to form P3 technology to uh, partner with Question Pro to be able to uh, help the survey experience, not for just those who are able. So this is what it looked like. Uh, me, the French horn, screaming at Ariel, please, please take my survey, please uh, answer my questions. And her just standing there being like, I, I don't know what you want me to do. You're uh, discriminating against me. So let's change the way we think. Current screening processes isolate those with lower education, socioeconomic status, certain ethnicities, and especially those with disabilities. Let's look at some of the worst offenders. The ADA homepage. The ADA homepage has 164 different inaccessible pieces of content on the homepage. So don't feel bad if, if you're starting from like I was and didn't have a clue what you didn't know. So from there, if the ADA can't do it, how can we do it, right? So let's learn. The EU equivalent is just as bad. Readability scores, graphics, alt text, it's, it's terrible. So about 10, I have done 4.8 million interviews I directly managed that were not accessible. I'm not proud of that, but it's where I am. Uh, six is the number of times it took me to get a passing grade in college algebra. Uh, this number is out of date. I've had eight eye surgeries. Um, and you know I've got one single purpose and it's to lead with love and make the world a more equitable, equ equitable and accessible place. I've done 4.8 at seven minute LOI, because we're all research nerds here. That's 339,600,000 wasted minutes of human life. Uh, actually, that's 33,600,000. Um, pretty bad at math, told you that. Um, currently, consent is assumed. When you are putting your uh, your intro to a survey and the language that you have there is not very, I would say, uh, not very accessible <clears throat> to many people. And by default, a lot of companies have templates where it says, hi, my name is X. I am from this company. There are no harm with this survey. Um, contact me if there's an issue type of thing. Let's go to one that I took personally when I was doing a survey. 
as a result of being selected, blah, 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 confidentiality of all the aforementioned information, blah, 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 IP address, um, blah, blah, blah. Let's see here. So using the readability calculator, you can see all of the different scores that you have. The Fleisch uh, reading score, Gunning Fog, Fleisch Kincaid, Coleman Liao, uh, Smog Index. Um, there's seven different calculations. A lot of them are saying that you have to be a college graduate or above. It's extremely difficult to read a college graduate or a senior in high school. Let's, uh, let's dig into why that is not okay. Let's look at the educational attainment by race. Less, uh, the, the percentage of Americans that have less than a high school diploma is 8.9%. So 8.9% of people who go through that survey do not know what they just agreed to. Here's education rates by sex, by race, the low end to the high end. And what that means is these are the percentage of population that do not have a high school diploma or a GED. So these numbers are at minimum the percentages of people that you are leaving out of your study. We'll get to this in a second, but the Hispanic population is the number one growing ethnicity in the United States. And you're leaving out 35.7%. Man, that was hard for me to look in the mirror. I don't know about you. Um, Here's by nativity, bachelor's degree, to be able to read the consent. Um, let's talk about inclusivity. One in four people experience a disability in the United States. Not all disabilities are visual. Some people have issues um, internally and in the brain. Let's talk about why it's important for you as a researcher or a marketer. Um, disabled people have $490 billion in disposable income to buy your goods, to vote with their dollars for you. Discretionary income after you've paid everything and you are just looking for things to buy to make yourself happy, make your life better. Um, $21 billion still left out there. Well, go get it. <laughs> Pick it up. 73% of disabled people experience barriers to accessing your website. That's huge. Again, not all disabilities are visible. Here's a list of a lot of the disabilities that you have to consider when building a survey. Let's talk about vision issues. Um, you can go to lighthouse.fortworth.org uh, vision simulator to see uh, what it looks like if you had cataracts or glaucoma or anything like that and see the content on of your survey. So mistakes I've made, um, like I said earlier, um, not defaulting to closed caption. Um, auto advance should be uh, when you answer the question, the next question populates, that should be en enabled by default because that helps people with upper limb mobility issues. Um, Self-first thinking. Uh, if it's not happening to me, then it's not happening. Um, it's very selfish and, and something that I've uh, been working on. Um, Zoom translations are not accurate. Uh, we are a global company and if you put on Zoom captions, you are not able to understand anyone uh, who has a accent. Um, key themes uh, of the Hispanic acculturation, um, red herring questions uh, are very discriminatory. Um, 
Let's see the next one. So here is the market spending of the largest growing segment of America. Remember when you were disregarding 34.7% up to that? Um, they have $1.28 trillion to spend. So when I think about this question, although this is a standard qualification in most from most suppliers of, and respondents, um, I've gotten some feedback that this should be Latin X uh, because there are people that are identifying as different genders. It gets kind of murky when you think about the language is very masculine and feminine, um, but we can get into that another time. These are the different um, the different countries that uh, of origin of Spanish speakers. You see that little box that says other? Let's dig into that other box. What about Bolivia, Brazil, Chile, Costa Rica, Dominican Republic, Honduras, Paraguay, and Uruguay? If you're leaving all of those out, um, you're leaving out 8.6% of the population, 54 million people. That is way more than the population of Los Angeles. The Dominican Republic is closer than I am to Miami. So you should leave me out if you're going to leave someone out. Uh, I love this meme. Do you know how frustrating it is to have to translate everything in my head? Before I say it, do you even know how smart I am in Spanish? This is the sentiment that I feel like whenever I have a survey that I uh, visually cannot see. I, I really want to give my opinion. I really want to vote. Um, every survey is your chance to vote. And if you can't vote, it's really it's a really scary world that we can live in. Um, and I want to be a part where everyone's heard and in, in a world where everyone's heard. So solutions in closing, let's change the way we think. I would, uh, Dan did the masterclass here. Um, with Question Pro, you're able to um, script against the geo variable IP. And you can say that's Miami. Um, with a self-identified zip code, county of origin, um, the Hispanic acculturation origin should be Dominican Republic, and the majority of the language spoken at home is 50% Spanish. Then you can ask questions around cultural significance, um, around male and female gender considerations. The Valuable 500 is encouraging the development of digital technologies to support people with disabilities. Let's talk about some of the ways that they're able to help out. So Seeing AI, it's a smartphone camera that audio describes everything around you. Google Action Blocks, it's kind of like the jitterbug for uh, someone who is blind. Um, it, it says, you know, call this person, go here, do this, play music, things like that. Zoom transcripts, I said they're a little bit problematic, but they're always improving. That's the best thing about software. Android voice access. Um, this helps people with motor disabilities. Uh, they, you can control the device with your voice, so the upper limb mobility uh, individuals that I was speaking about earlier. And I would really encourage you to involve someone with various backgrounds from the beginning um, because you don't know what you don't know. Um, inclusive design, nothing about them without them. Don't observe the condition. You have to live in the person's world and the world of those who love them. I can't tell you how important this is. Um, if you are looking for someone to audit your surveys. Um, there are vocational programs federally funded that are free uh, to you, 
to have someone who is disabled um, do, uh, make an hourly wage uh, and the government will subsidize that. So there's no reason why you shouldn't go through the vocational office of your uh, state. Tom Brady doesn't ask uh, a running back for permission to make decisions. You have to own your own personal standard of inclusivity. Whether you are brand new, whether you've been doing this for 190,000 years, you have to own up and say, hey, I'm not going to avoid them anymore. I'm going to include as many people as I can. And from my work with Question Pro and, and P3, I have found that it is a lot more cost effective to involve uh, these populations at the beginning than to go back. The social cost is incredible, as well as the economic cost. So the last quote that I would give you is from Maya Angelou. Once you know better, do better. That is a summation of that quote. Um, now that you know a few things, let's have a conversation and let's talk about, you know, how can you reach certain populations? It's not just about your reach. It's not a supply and a buy problem. Um, I think that it really transitions into a, this is something we haven't considered before. So let's start thinking about it because it's affecting uh, everything that we do. Thank you for watching. Um, I'm always able to, to talk about it. Uh, if you have any questions, you can find me on LinkedIn. My email is timothy.cornelius at questionpro.com. Um, and let's just do better. Thanks, guys. And gals and everyone else. Awesome. Thanks, Tim. That was really interesting. I like that you put a number, like an economic number behind it, because I think that's what will get people listening, right? It's not, mm -hmm. I think everybody says, yeah, inclusion is, is important, but oftentimes, unless there's like an economic incentive to it, unfortunately, you know, people don't listen. So I thought that was interesting how you put those numbers to it. What, what are some good, I know you mentioned a few good starting points, but is when someone creates their survey, do you recommend they run it through some of those different checks that you mentioned ahead of time? Or I think largely it's sort of an afterthought, right? But now, mm -hmm. as you mentioned, you know, make it as part of your process. So is, is it as simple as that of making it as one of those checklist items before they send out their survey? So I wouldn't say that it's, I wouldn't say that it's simple, um, but I would say that, you know, trust it to the experts. Um, mm -hmm. you know, and if you're not an expert, give it to somebody who is Intel. Um, you can learn from them. And I know that our managed service team, uh, as well as myself can help you put these surveys together and find out what you can ask legally, socially, um, things like that. Got it. And I know Question Pro took a lot of time and made our surveys super accessible for respondents as well. So kind of reverse engineered it, thinking about people with disabilities, special needs and so forth. So we have done a lot on that front as well. A few questions came in. Um, the first one is, you know, what are some excuses that you hear agencies giving um, to not making surveys accessible? Do you hear any any good excuses or reasons why they don't do it? Uh, yeah, um, I, you know, there's a lot of researchers out there who don't take their own surveys. So mm -hmm. I, don't, you, it, I think it's a time constraint. Right. I think it's a, this is the way we've always done things. Mm -hmm. um, and that is... Uh, pretty much a cancer for your research. Uh, the biggest issue that I've come across, and you know, at first I didn't know how to handle it, um, was I had a CPG, one of the largest CPGs, come to me and ask, you know, look, we've been running this tracker for ten years, and you're telling me that we are leaving out this much, potentially this much of the population. Mm -hmm. And I said, yeah, watch this. And I, uh, I showed them one of the emulators and I took their survey with them on the line and showed that there was absolutely no way to uh, finish the survey with mm -hmm. the conditions that they had. And I walked them through different simulators, emulators, and uh, I showed them, you know, these are the people that you're missing. So it's, uh, that's, that's the biggest challenge that I've come up with is, you know, the 
people who say, you know, it's a tracking study. I can't change that. Look at the mm -hmm. census from the 1920s and 30s. You will be embarrassed at our history about mm -hmm. different types of demographics that we asked and different uh, questions. Um, so if, if the census is, is wrong and that's, you know, our country's longest tracking survey, sure, sure. Um, you know, it, it's okay. You can change. And you're changing, you're changing for the better too, right? Not yeah. a mistake that someone made or something happened. Like you're, yeah. you're, you're changing for the better, getting more inclusive. Mm -hmm. um, another question came up is, um, is the need for respondents more important than the need for equality? It's a great question. No, I would take 10% great quality than I would... Um, 90% poor quality. Mm. Um, I think, I think a, a smaller sample size where you are incentivizing at a higher rate is more important than, you know, having the bulk numbers. So whether you have 4,000, you know, just programmatic answers or you have 400 um, deeply profiled respondents, I think that you're going to have better insight. Hmm. Do you think do you think it's a situation in general around this or I mean even you showed the ADA website and they're not you know they're not fully compliant at all is it a matter of being 100% compliant or more compliant than you currently are if that makes sense So I would say that's a starting point um the type of accessibility that we use um, as a company, first it started out with, hey, we've got to we got to make sure that the ADA guidelines are covered, and then we got to make sure that the world guidelines are covered, mm -hmm. and then we decided, hey, you know, we've got to we've got to do even more than that, and then we kind of just sat back and we're like, oh crap, um, we've got to make this better. So if the Wait. ADA, it's a starting point. Uh, mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's a summation, and the ADA is the minimum that you need to do um, from your website. Got it. Got it. Makes sense. And then, you know, kind of a final question, even around, you know, you had that big list of, you know, countries, I think in South America, or, you know, you mentioned all of those, what, what sort of ways, I mean, is it a matter of identifying the problem and then obviously you need to figure out solutions for it? But I'm thinking, you know, that's a long list of additional countries to include. I mean, is it practical? I mean, how would you, what would you say to that? Like, am I going to get make sure that I get, you know, a certain percentage of this audience for each one of those, or is, can I just, you know, loop them in altogether? Like, what would you say to that for maybe budgets are constrained or, you know, different things of, of that nature that kind of restrict you from that, getting all of those different regions in your survey? Yeah. Um, you know, I would say, you know, if, if you want to start disqualifying people, then you can start with, Let's kick all males out of surveys. Um, I think it's it's just as important to mm -hmm. get those groups of people. And if you can't get them, find someone who can. Mm -hmm. um, partner with someone. If they're not in your community or, or with your sample partners, um, then find find someone who can get them. You know, there's a lot of Hispanics and other uh, people that have immigrated to the United States that don't have bank accounts. Um, so when they get paid, they can't get a debit card. Mm -hmm. like it's just, and if you can't get a debit card, you have a phone that has really spotty internet access. Uh, right. And it's just hard to get those people. And, you know, we're not going out with clipboards anymore um, for the most part. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hopefully There's not. That too. I'm going to show yeah. up and knock on your door one of these days. <laughs> Make sure you have an offline device from Question Pro, okay? Yeah, right. <laughs> I've had many. I hope, uh, there you go. I'll take that. Awesome. Hey, Tim, thanks so much. If people have questions for Tim, contact him. He's always up for conversations, I know, around this, this subject or anything. So, Tim, thanks so much for your presentation today. I really enjoyed it. Thanks, everybody. I cut him off. I didn't mean to. <laughs> It was real, you run a real tight ship here. You know? I try, man. 1229. I was like, we only got one minute left. I know. Don't you, I know. don't you worry.
Don't you worry. Wow, that was so good. And guys, if you have not heard Tim talk about, you know, the accessibility and your surveys, really like, you know, find us. I know he's spoken at SampleCon. He spoke at IIEX. We've really been trying to prioritize this uh, narrative as we mm -hmm. really know that we need to lead with insights, which is our theme for the next this X day. Mm -hmm. And just that was so good. Yeah, it's awesome. Oh, awesome. Really good stuff. Yeah. Perfect. Wow. We are moving right along no, here no, at uh, Spring X Day 2022. And we are so happy that you are joining us across LinkedIn, YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook. And of course, make sure that you leave comments for us in the comment section. We've been popping them up on the screen. I'm going to make sure we haven't missed any. Um, make sure you get your coffee. Make sure you follow us. Make sure you do all the activities. Um, yeah. And make sure you join us tomorrow. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna actually. I'm gonna tune into these other ones. I want to. Are you? You're gonna. I'm, you're gonna give them of your time. Oh, Dan, my That's so time, kind I will, of you. <laughs> I will give my time for these other activities. No, I think it's interesting. There's a lot of good speakers, good content, and even I learned something new. So. It's, Ooh, yeah. I love that. Mm. Well, as we've been getting ready to kind of enter our last session of the day. Um, we are going to be talking about the five things you didn't know you could do with Question Pro. Yeah, let's get right into it. Let's see here. Give me, oh no, never mind. I was going to do the twirly thing, but then it's just us. I mean, <laughs> you can hold people in suspense, you know. So. <laughs> um, okay, are you going to click the button? Are you, Dan and I, if anybody's been watching this <laughs> afternoon, Dan and I have been in a bit of a button war. <laughs> Click the button. Um, I, I'll, I got it. You got it? Yeah. <laughs> Boom. There Bam. Bam, as Emma would say. Okay. Um, so what we want to talk about here, oh, let's take a minute for quirks. So I know there was a comment on YouTube around they wanted the link for it, but we'll also post the QR code maybe here. You can click. Yep, I got to find it. I'm finding it. All right. Scan this QR code that's about to show up. Scan this go. QR code. Don't read the words. Yeah, scan the QR code um, to enter to win tickets to um, tickets for Quirks New York. I'll be there uh, in July. So feel free to scan that QR code and enter in. There's also a link you can check in the comments. If you don't see it, just kind of scroll up and down, and, and I'm sure you'll find it. I know they just reposted it as well. So you will be able to see that pretty easy there and be able to enter to win those tickets. We'll be announcing the winner today, tomorrow, sometime this week. Um, I can guarantee that. <laughs> so cross your fingers and hope that you're the winner. All right, let's get into five things you probably didn't know you could do with Question Pro. And I say this a little bit because you may have known this, but maybe you know about the feature, but you don't know the details, don't know how it works. And I hear a lot around, I don't know you guys had that. And to me, it seems pretty obvious because, you know, we're in the product on a day-to-day -day basis. But these are five things that I came up with that I thought that you would want to know. All right, look at that. Nice. Okay. <laughs> I kind of forgot they were there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So the first one, and I'll what I'm going to do is go over these five things um, on the slides here. And then we'll dive in and I'll show you an example inside of Question Bro how to do this. So just wanted to tee these up and then we'll get into the actual application of it. So extraction, so where you can display options of a multi-select question um, as answer types to follow up questions. You can do extraction on extraction and I'll show you all the different options there. So that's something that you may have known that we have, but not to the depth or all the different options. So I wanna cover that okay. as well. Um, question block, so you can group your questions into different blocks, not only just for organizational purposes, but also for, you can use it for logic, for randomization, and I'll show you a practical exercise here coming up. Another one that we have is review mode. Now, I really mm -hmm. like review mode because it is a collaborative way that you can get feedback from users outside of Question Pro. So let's say you're programming a survey, you wanna send it to a client or a stakeholder, but they don't have a Question Pro license, you can send it to them. They get, a, they get a view of it and they can enter in their comments. They can see all of the different things that are going on and you get it in a real concise way. 
Um, here you can see it on the right hand side. You can see some comments there. I'll show you a closer view, of course. But what this does is it relieves the dreaded email thread of all the different changes and you have to try to track it. This is all in one spot. So this review mode is key in that regard. Um, next is org survey templates. So I'm often asked, hey, I have a bunch of templates. How can I do this in Question Pro? And I want these um, surveys um, to be accessible for my organization. And I'll show you a way that you can do that just by using the tools in Question Pro. So I thought that's something that's come up a lot <clears throat> recently. So I wanted to remind people of it and the way that they can do it here just with some additional functionalities that we have. And the final one is audience self-service. I love this one. I, know, this I love pushing fun. buttons. Yes. So <laughs> here you can easily, you have your survey, you can send it out. We It's all done programmatically using you know our technology to not only filter on who your audience is, send it out, get the results back, you know, and this is all done inside of Question Pro. So we have this. I think some people might know that we have it, but what I would really want to show is the ease of use of this particular feature. So why don't we do this? I will share my screen here, and we can dive right into these different features. Oh, here. are you going to live demo these? Yeah, we're live demoing right now. Oh, yeah. This <laughs> So let me this get this going here. Okay. You all can learn along with me. This is how we, um, you know, really prioritize <laughs> things at Question Pro. What does Crystal not know? <laughs> <laughs> See, there we go. Okay. So the first one I want to show you is extraction. So I will come to this example that I set up here. And really extraction allows for you on a multi-select to then extract these options into follow-up questions. So you can see here I have this question, which of the following sports do you enjoy? And I have football, soccer, golf, swimming, baseball, tennis, or not applicable, which will screen you out. But um, you have here, you know, I have this matrix question that will only have those options that were selected in this previous question. Right. Will only show up on the preview, which I'll show. And then I also have, you know, please rank these options as well. So what we can do here is... I'll show you how I set this up is you just go to logic mm -hmm. and then you can go to extraction and there's many different options that you can choose here. It's not just a simple extraction. You can base it off the choices that were selected. Maybe you want to know about some of them that weren't selected. Like why didn't you select these options and get more information about that? Mm -hmm. The choices that were displayed or not displayed, depending on what logic you're using here or all choices, you can choose to ex always extract all of them. You can extract them to different question types. So if it's single select, multi-select, drop down, matrix, star rating, drag and drop, constant sum. So many different question types that you can extract to. And we also have a few other options that you can make use of, of you know, always extract. Let's say you're asking, which of the following brands do you use? And right. if your brand wasn't selected, and you want to ask about that, you can choose to always extract your brand as well or whatever option might be there. Uh, similarly, we can choose to never extract options as well, and you can select from those here. So what does this look like practically? So I have my questions here. Uh, let's say I say football, golf, swimming, and baseball. Right. Uh, I can start this. You can see football, um, swimming, soccer, baseball were selected. And then I can easily go here. And then I can go football, soccer, and I can rank these. So maybe football's one. This soccer one. should be one. Sorry. All right, fine. Fine. <laughs> we'll go, we'll go with soccer one. That was... I know you're the timber fan there. Okay. Uh-huh. All right. And then done. So there you go. So that's that's extraction. So that's something that you can easily make use of as well as using extraction in your surveys. It's easier to set up than uh, previously. You'd have to go and set all, you know, show hide options for all of these, which can be a pain. This mm. makes it easy. If you wanted to do another extraction question off this one, I've already done two, but you can easily do that as well. So you just come in here, um, do your choices, and then you can select the question type that you want to have it extract to, and then you're good to go. So with that, that was extraction. 
Um, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> um, I was like, you didn't see me raising my hand. <laughs> um, what? So what benefit would this have over piping then? Yeah, you can still use piping. So you may want to do looping if it's a series of questions and you okay. want to ask about that same answer option in each question before it loops onto the next one. Right. So there are two, kind of two different use cases here. This would be more for based on the answers that they either um, selected or didn't select. You want to ask follow-up questions. Pretty typical example is, you know, what of the following have you heard of? And then having them choose their most favorite or, um, you know, options. So Kind of two different use cases depending on on the survey and, and what you're doing. Good to know. Cool. And then next up we have blocks. So I want to show you question blocks here. Um, this is an example that I set up where you have these different images. So these are all different blocks. So you have image one, image two, image three, and you can see each image here. Then you have a question. You know, please take a look at the image. How likely would you be to visit this place? And what I want to do is you can set up these blocks, obviously, to organize your survey into different sections. But you can also, if you come over here and go to Tools, and then you go to Block Flow, you can do um, many different options here. So if you wanted to, um, this is the current Block Flow here. But if you wanted to add a randomizer, you can do that. So if you drag in these different blocks, you can all drag them in here. And then you can choose to randomly display one of these from the list below. So that oh. way, if you wanted to randomize them, you can do that. You can ev evenly present the blocks. So that way, if you know each one is shown uh, equal amount of times. So that way, if you have a long list or you have mm. a long battery of questions in each block, you can easily choose to randomize those. You can also add logic. So if you wanted to reset this. And you can add logic to the block. Exactly. Yeah. So I can oh, add logic here. See, so, I definitely always thought blocks were just about organization. No, no. That's just the tip of the iceberg there. There's much Ooh. more um, <laughs> under the sea that you can that you can do here. And so there's a lot, of, lot you can do in terms of like adding logic. Like maybe you only want to show this block if they answer a question in this way. And so with a block flow, there's not only randomization, but logic that you can do based on the block as well. So a lot you can do there with um, with blocks and block flow, but that's something that's easy to set up here. So again, it's just under here, um, block flow. And then I have an example set up here, which I was gonna use that I'll show you later and I can show you kind of a practical application, another one of, of blocks. The next one I wanted to show was this review mode. So. I believe it was this survey here that I had some response or that I had the review mode in. To get the review mode, you just go to tools and then you go to review mode. And then- Where did you go? Tools? Tools up here and then to <laughs> review mode. Sometimes then, you move very quickly. Sorry, I'll go slower, okay? <laughs> <laughs> and then um, you can see here that you can add in different comments. You can also share this. So if you have this share, um, icon, you click that, you can enter in the email addresses of the reviewers. Now, these can be people that are in Question Pro or Question Pro users inside of your platform, or it can be people externally, and you want different stakeholders oh. or people to review the survey. They'll get much like the preview mode, and then you can see in there, they can add in their, you know, these different comments that they have, and you can organize it by each of these different questions. So. This is something you can do. You can add in comments here, like, um, you know, let's take a look at the wording. And this, typically how this would be done is you would take the survey link, email it out to people, and they would all reply back either in a document or they would reply back in the email. And luck can get lost, it gets messy, it's hard you know, to organize this information. But here you'd be able to clearly see on each of these different questions, what are the comments, what I need to take a look at, and similarly, you can reply back to the comment as well. Oh, that's so, fun. Yeah, so much like a, a collaboration style. And I think you can kind of see the direction here we're moving with not only from the, we're on the workspace, we're introducing the multi-use and allowing people to go in. The collaboration we see as a key component for Insights mm -hmm. teams working to get their surveys up and running. So, because right now, so much of it is just done. Oh, my God. So much of it is done just like through Word documents, right? Yeah, exactly. Word documents, 
just even email threads. So it's it's mm -hmm. not real clean, right? So yeah. this review mode definitely helps out with that. And it's something that we have that maybe some people don't know about. Um, I didn't know about it and I work here. See, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, That's not, all right. not we're, saying much though. <laughs> we're, we're flying right through these, which is all right. And the next one that I wanted to showcase was templates. So oftentimes your organization has surveys that they've you've programmed with logic, with everything that you want to be able to allow your other users to access, to copy into their, you know, to be able to copy over and to use for, uh, with, in their research. Now you can do this pretty easily in Question Pro just by adding a new folder. You can name it. I have one named templates here, but you would add this, name the folder. And then here you can put all of your different surveys in this folder. So here I have everything from a, maybe a, co a company satisfaction survey, so services engagement, uh, employee satisfaction for larger companies. So um, those, you know, let's say these are the templates that I have. What you can do is when you go to share this folder, there's different options here. So you can see here that you can select company will have access to edit, co uh, company oh. name, uh, the company will have access to reports or even just to access to copy the survey. So if you select this one, they're only going to get copy access. You can ensure that the survey template can't get edited by anybody else. They can only copy it so that it locks it down. And that way it can only be used for a template. So if you use this option, then you're good to go. And people can only come in here. They can view it and then they can copy it. That's all they can do. So they won't be able to edit the logic or access the questions. You can ensure that your template stays intact. Hmm. Yeah. I have, I'm a classic template editor, even on my own stuff, like in Google Docs. And then I'll be like editing the wrong. And I'm like, no. Yeah. How many times do you forget to like create a copy and you start editing in there and you're yeah. like, oh, this is done. Okay. So <laughs> that happens all the time. And this is a good way. I mean, you can use this for templates. Organization obviously is, is a key mm -hmm. component at, um, at companies. So this is a way that I've always recommended people um, to do it. And I don't think a lot of people, you know, kind of think about it like that, but this is how you can do use templates inside of, of Question Pro. All right. The last thing that I wanted to show was this, um, was the audience self-service. So I'm going to go to this survey here. And in this survey, you can see that I have it divided into the intro, different locations, kind of similar to the other survey that I showed around blocks. In this survey, I do have the block flow set up so that it's randomly displaying one of the locations. And what you can do here is let's say I wanted to send this out. I go to research suite, I click on audience, it brings me here, and then I can create a new project. So what I'm going to do, I'll name this project next day, 2022, for obvious reasons. I'll click <laughs> the completion date. Uh, maybe I want it done by next week. And then here you can select the survey. So I'm gonna scroll down and go to my folder here. That is this X day. I want this India location survey. And then here I can select a number of respondents that I wanna send it out to. So anywhere from you know 10 to 5,000. So let's say I wanna do hundred people. You can see that as I'm going through this, it'll start to build out the price as well. So here I want, United States, my instance level here is going to be high. I'm going to go 90%. You can see here that for 100 completes, it's going to be $1.50 per. So it's going to cost me $150. Now, I you can load up a balance in here. So okay. And all of those credits can be used, you know, for the survey you're sending out here. But as I get more specific, you can start to see, you know, this price could change depending on. Um, how easy or hard the different audiences is. So maybe I only want 18 to 24, or you know, you can start to select the different ranges or of your sample population that you need and different ethnicities. If you want to target specific um, ethnicities, you can do that here. Um, annual income, relationship status, states, um, employment status, all these different things you can target. Then hit create, and then it will it will go and it'll send out your survey. So for this, I'm just gonna go 10 here and, and I'm gonna clear all these and I'm just gonna run this, let's see. 
I'll hit create here. So my project was created successfully. And you can see the bid here, it's one minute, it's easy survey, it's only one question. See my total cost is gonna be $15, completed interviews, and then there's my total cost per interview. Gives you a credit balance here, so you can easily see how much credit you can add more if you need. And then what it will do is um, you can come in here and there's some different options if you want to soft launch or if you want it to go live. Oh, um, what? Wait. You know, yeah. So soft launch would be a certain percentage of your completes. It'll get those. It'll stop. That way you can check the data and you can make sure everything is good to go before you go into the full launch. So um, that's I what here. I love that. Yeah. So it's only 10 here. So I'm just going to go live. And then it is processing all of the data here. So your project will be launched uh, to collect 10 interviews. Total cost is $15. Uh, please know, you know, if it, if your metrics and field differ, we'll automatically stop the project as well and then let you know the additional price of that. So here you okay. can hit launch and then you're you're good to go. So the survey is live. Here's one that I, I completed a while back, um, a similar oh. process, but yeah. and you can see all the different projects that you ran in here and all this data you know, obviously flows right back into Question Pro on the research suite here. So you can, if I come in here and I see the previous survey that I fielded, you can see all those results as well. Let me just... Interesting. So yeah, you can do that. Let me see what that one was. Anyway, um, so you can come back here. Let's see where this is at. It looks like it's starting to get maybe get some responses, but that is how yeah, you can see one viewed, one total response. One person dropped out already. Oh. So um, you can start to see, you know, these results as they come in real time as well. So this is the audience self-service, super easy to use. You know, it's coming here. It's available to anyone on Research Suite. And you can come in here, send out your projects. Works well, especially if you're doing, you know, some gen pop or even need some additional criteria. Um, this works very well and is quick and efficient um, for fielding your surveys. So those are the five things that I wanted to show. And I hope everybody learned something new. If you have other <laughs> if you have questions on this, definitely let us know. I'll be happy to reach out. And I definitely learned something new. But I also wait. Oh, oh. what's up? I saw you had text highlighter. Yeah, here. yeah, we do. I showed. We, I know you guys talked about it during, um, during yep. uh, the, you know, product showcase. But you yep. really have it in here live right now. Yeah. And so how there we've added a bunch of transitions to this too because you have an option right to add commentary now. You can as a yep. viewer. You can add. Yeah, you can add commentary. So if I preview this. Let's say I go in here and I you know, highlight this section. I dislike it. And you can say, you know, the wording here is off. Whatever it might be, you can save it. And then similarly, if you come in here, you like it, you can either choose to add it or not. And then and then you're done. So what you'll, when in the results, you'll see those comments as well. So if you go to analytics here and then you go to text highlighter. Ooh. You can see here we have 13 responses. So you can see um, here if you turn on these comments, you can see all the different comments that you know can that come in. Like wording's off. Really like the really word. Really like the word. Yeah, nice, nice, great. Well said. <laughs> so you can get all those comments here and then of course get them off. You can export this, you can share it via link as well. So a number of options here to get exactly who you want. One nice thing I, I like as well is you can filter. So let's say you want to see how your responses for text highlighter vary across different segments. You can easily do that as well, where you can see, hey, maybe this group likes the section, this group doesn't like the section. So there's a lot of things you can do. I'm using these filters here um, that you can utilize inside of Question Pro as well. That's awesome. It does look like we have a question sure. from Catherine. Do we know how many possible participants may qualify in the audience self-service? Yeah, it'll it'll show you if it's feasible or not. So if it's not feasible, it'll say, hey, not feasible, please contact 
sales. And then that's where Tim's project management team can come in and help find that audience. It's not all criteria and that's available to us. We've limited the criteria here to, you know, some of the most common use cases, but okay. if it doesn't, then we can definitely help you out. It'll let you know like, Hey, we can't do this with a self-service, but we can do this with. Yeah. I with know Tim you. has found some crazy mm -hmm. demographic, like some crazy samples that are like, you know, I don't know, like a, a person who operates a garbage truck on the left side instead of the right. I don't know. <laughs> That's probably specific, but yeah, he can, I'm sure he could find that. <laughs> you know, things that float around my head. You know? I just, just want to, you know, sample all the people. Yeah, I know. I know. I get it. I get it. So, no, we can definitely help you out with, you know, the craziest of the crazy qualifications that you're looking for. <laughs> um. Well, this is awesome. Thank you so much, Dan, for teaching us so much. Yeah, you're welcome. I'm excited to showcase the platform. And if anybody has any questions after this, don't hesitate to reach out. Well, you guys, I think we've made it. Yes. Is this the end of Research Monday? This is the end of Research Monday. So I think it is. <laughs> well, we want to keep, it, keep it going if there's questions or AMA or anything. <laughs> well, we're always willing to keep it going if there's questions. But one last reminder. Make sure you get a copy of Matt's book from this morning and go back and rewatch that segment if you missed it. It yep. was, he did such a great job at telling us why, you know, research or advertising agencies and marketing really need market research and why market researchers really need marketing. Yeah. And so, you know, he really was a real inspirational and kickoff to us. If you missed that, keep an eye on your email. We will be sending out all the video links and all the slide decks and everything to those who pre-registered. Also, remember that we're giving away tickets to Quirks in New York. So make sure to come and join us there. And then please, please join us tomorrow for... CX. Nice. <laughs> um, CX that will be um, online tomorrow talking about all things that research or all things CX. Woo, my brain uh, talking about all things CX. And so we are cannot wait for a few more days of X day. And I don't know. I'm excited. No, it's awesome. I think this is a good kickoff. I'm excited for for CX tomorrow and workforce on Wednesday. So that's awesome. We can round it's gonna that It's going to be awesome. Yes. I, I, we need to come up with another synonym. It's going to be I wonderful. Insightful. Great, <laughs> insightful. Intellectual. <laughs> well, I was like, oh, I was going to like try and like fill those three minutes, but we don't really <laughs> <laughs> I think have we're to I, do I think, it right on the yeah. dot. <laughs> but you know what? We're so grateful that you all joined us across Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and LinkedIn. And make sure to join us tomorrow at 10 a.m. Central. We can't wait to see you. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. Really appreciate it. Bye.